Good morning, everybody. You're all very welcome to St. Patrick's Mental Health Services Founders Day Conference, held annually to recognise and continue the pioneering legacy of St. Patrick's Mental Health Services founder, Jonathan Swift. This year's theme is prevention and promotion strategies in youth mental health. And over the next few hours, we'll explore current research in the area, and we'll discuss how prevention and promotion strategies are being and can be implemented in an Irish setting. We're delighted to welcome a wonderful range of speakers today who are going to highlight national and international perspectives. And we'll also hear from two youth mental health advocates who will share their lived experience of the issues affecting youth mental, mental health, as well as how we can better support young people's mental health. Just to give you a sense of how the day is organised, we have four sessions, beginning with a welcome and introduction by Paul Gilligan, who's CEO of St. Patrick's Mental Health Services, and Paul Fearon, Medical Director at St. Patrick's, followed by Minister for Mental Health, Mary Butler, TD, who will deliver the opening address. After that, we'll hear from our first youth advocate, Diana Chow, who's joining us all the way from the US, and she'll be followed by our plenary lecture from Professor Patrick McGarry, who's joining us from even further afield in Australia. After the plenary lecture, we'll have a short break before we commence our research session, where we'll hear from Mary Cannon, Ruth O'Connell, Margaret Barry, and Professor Fiona McNicholas. The mid-morning session then will focus on the implementation of prevention and promotion strategies, where we'll be joined by Tiernan O'Neill, Niall Muldoon, Professor Algier Christiansen, and youth mental health advocate Blessing Dada. At the end of both the research and implementation sessions, we'll have a panel discussion with the session speakers. So if you have any questions throughout the event, please feel free to submit those through the Q&A box. And if you include who the question is for, and then we'll do our best to get through as many of those as possible during each of the panel discussions. For anybody with accessibility requirements, you could turn on closed captions by clicking on the live transcript function in your Zoom window. Before we kick off with an introduction from our CEO, Paul Gilligan, just a note to say that CPD certificates will automatically be sent to those attendees who registered for CPD when signing up for today's conference. But please do allow about six weeks for receipt of the cert. You can also follow along with the conference on our social media channels, which we'll share via the chat box. So let's get started with an introduction from Paul Gilligan, Chief Executive of St. Patrick's Mental Health Services. Good morning, Paul. Now we seem to be having a little bit of difficulty there getting Paul Gilligan, but luckily we have another Paul. <laughs> so we're going to skip ahead to Professor Paul Fearon, Medical Director at St. Patrick's Mental Health Services. Good morning, Paul. Oh, have we Paul Gilligan there? Sorry. Oh, yes. So well, we have all really yeah. Apologies. <laughs> we have an embarrassment of riches in the poll department. So if we good morning, good morning everybody. Apologies. Um, I think we had a slight technical hitch there. Uh, I'd also like to welcome you all to this event and thank you for 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 making the time. Um, significant numbers of children and young people are experiencing mental health difficulties and are not receiving the help they require. Many others are likely experiencing difficulties that that are going undetected. Experience of mental, mental ill health and poor emotional well-being can have a significant adverse impact 
on a child's experience and attainment at school, their friendships and family relationships, and their day-to-day -day life. When problems are unidentified, or the child or young person is unsupported, or appropriate and timely help is not provided, the child young person can deteriorate. Under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, every child has a right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. This right covers the full spectrum of health and well-being, and the guaranteeing of the right requires a comprehensive, multi-sectoral response through integrated systems that involve parents, peers, the wider family and schools. The United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child endorses a public health and psychosocial support approach to mental health rather than just medicalization and institutionalization. In 1992, Ireland ratified, sorry, committed to promoting all children's rights, including the right to health, when it ratified the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Ireland was last examined by the committee in 2016, and at that time, the committee expressed several concerns relating to mental health care, including the long waiting times for treatment, the lack of access to out of hour support, and children being admitted to adult psychiatric wards owing to inadequate availability of mental health care facilities for children. The committee recommended that Ireland improve the, the capacities and quality of its mental health care services for children and adolescents, and we all know that it's likely that the next review will express similar concerns. Evidence indicates that children and adolescents experiencing even the most severe mental health difficulties can, with the right support at the right time, make a full recovery and live fulfilling and productive lives. The expectations of children and parents to be given the opportunity to live mentally healthy lives have risen, and the system cannot cope with the additional demands being placed on it, and COVID has undoubtedly added to the demands on the system. Professionals, policymakers, and all those involved in providing care, particularly the people here today attending this conference, are working extremely hard, and some are finding themselves becoming burnt out, and that's a reality. So we need a plan, and we need it fast. Firstly, we need to map all existing mental health care services available to young people, and we need to incorporate them all into a strategy for service provision and the establishment of standardised care pathways. We need to identify and fill the gaps supported by a manpower strategy for mental health care in general, a strategy that goes beyond the traditional professions. And crucially, we need to develop a full range of preventive community and early intervention services, particularly in schools. I think this is why the theme of this conference today is so important. It's vital to invest adequately upstream and develop a coordinated multi-agency response to initial presentations of need to prevent conditions worsening over time and to give children and young people the opportunity to live mentally healthy lives. I think it's imperative that a comprehensive primary school's mental health service is established. Such a service would not only strengthen and support the mental well-being of thousands of children, but would also support parents and teachers, and it would reduce the number of children requiring specialist mental health treatment and support from CAMS teams. I want to thank the Founders Day Committee for its continued and extensive work on this event. This committee is led by Paul Fearon, who as medical director is continuing to drive a human rights based model of care and has brought a renewed focus on service user led research to our organisation. And we really appreciate that. I want to acknowledge the immense work of Tamara Nolan and our communications department in driving our awareness and advocacy work. I want to thank Jan for her continued superb involvement and support. And I want to welcome and thank Minister Butler for being here today. And I, I know that she has a particular passion for child and adolescent services and is doing everything she can to try and improve those services. And I also want to thank all the speakers who've come from far and wide uh, for giving us their time and their expertise. Although there are many challenges, I do feel we now have the opportunity to create a world-class child and adolescent mental health care system. The professionals, the people attending here today, working in the area, are immensely dedicated and committed. Young people have never been more aware of the importance of mental health, and parents have been mobilised to seek the best care possible. I know that a lot is already happening to change the current challenge services, but I feel that maybe from today we will find extra motivation to come together to create a rights-based system. I know that the work presented today will give us ideas and enthusiasm, and in partnership with children, young people and parents, we can achieve our goal of meeting the obligations we've committed to under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Thanks very much.
Thank you, Paul. Well, now ahead of the opening address from uh, Minister Butler, I'll hand you over to the medical director here at St. Patrick's, Professor Paul Fearon. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Paul. Many thanks and good morning, Jan, and good morning, everybody. Um, as always, I'm delighted to welcome you again to this year's Founders Day at St. Patrick's Mental Health Services. This is an annual event held in recognition of Jonathan Swift, whose bequest over 250 years ago led to the creation of St. Patrick's Hospital. And as with the last, um, the previous two years, it's been a privilege for me to help organise today's event with my colleagues at St. Patrick's. And we're really delighted, as Paula said, to have such a diverse range of speakers and perspectives today. We're joined today, for example, by experts based obviously in Ireland, Australia, the United States and, uh, and Thailand. Similar to last year, when we focused on mental health and human rights, this year's theme really kind of chose itself. Indeed, in many ways, it's an extension of many of the themes that were highlighted last year in relation to mental health and fundamental rights, but focusing this year specifically on younger people. We're living in a time when the mental health of young people has come into sharp, sharper focus than perhaps ever before. And this in many ways is a good thing, um, even if some of the recent causes for this focus are, are, are troubling. Today's young children, as we know, are growing up in an uncertain world. It's a uniquely challenging time for children and adolescents globally who are impacted by climate change and inaction, future financial uncertainty, the online world, and emerging social media influences, as well as the influence of the pandemic, with young people having been specifically identified as having been especially impacted by, by the pandemic. So while the pandemic has raised huge concerns for the mental health of young people, it's also increased awareness of mental health issues. And we now, I think, have a unique opportunity to promote good mental health for every child and to protect their human rights and the care for our children facing mental health challenges. Indeed, the significance of prevention and promotion is increasingly being recognised. For example, UNICEF's annual State of the World's Children Report focused specifically on mental health for the first time in 2021. And also children and youth mental health is also now a key work package on the new World Health Organization Pan-European Mental Health Coalition. And this makes good sense. Um, the, the first onset of mental health disorders typically occurs in childhood or adolescence. And given how many mental health difficulties begin from this time, it's a critical time for effective promotion and prevention strategies. And through such inter interventions, an individual's capacity to regulate emotions, build resilience and, managing, and manage challenging situations and adversity can be strengthened for all children and young people. Obviously, there's a need to invest upstream in mental health promotion and prevention services, not only to alleviate unsustainable pressures on child and adolescent mental health services, but even more importantly, to establish strong foundations for mental health amongst all our young people. Promotion and prevention programmes require a multi-level approach, taking into account health and social care settings, schools, the community and the home with varying strategies. The consequences of failing to address child and adolescent mental health conditions extend to adulthood, impairing both physical and mental health and limiting opportunities to live fulfilling lives as adults. So with that in mind, I'm once again absolutely delighted to welcome back the Minister for Mental Health and Older People, Mary Butler, TD, this morning to today's opening conference. She's been a real friend of this conference uh, over the last three years. And indeed, this is the third year that she's kindly made time in her undoubtedly crowded calendar to join us. We're, mo mo we're very grateful to you, Minister, for joining us today. And we I war warmly welcome you now and ask you to provide the opening address. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Uh, greetings. I'm actually here in, in Athlone this morning, where, where I will be at half past 10 launching um, uh, a Meals and Wheels, very first Meals and Wheels conference. Um, so good morning here from Athlone. And I'm always happy to share in the Founders Day uh, celebration. I wish to thank Paul Gilligan for once again inviting me to speak at this important event. And I would like also to acknowledge the participation of Paul Fearon. Paul, thank you very much um, for, for, for your words of wisdom there. And Jamie Flanagan, an event moderator at today's proceeding. Today's theme of minding your minds, prevention and promotion in youth mental health, I think has never been more timely and important for all of us working in the sector. And as I was preparing for today, I was struck by the fact that this is my third time um, uh, speaking to you for your Founders Day celebration. And it's hard to believe what the last uh, two and a half years have brought. Good progress has been made on this front over recent years in St. Patrick's or wider afield. And we need to continue to evolve and take action on emerging issues. 
In keeping with your historic and distinguished outlook, St. Patrick remains in the fore of identifying needs and proposing solutions around mental health care, including those uh, for young people. We all share, I'm sure, a fundamental common objective of promoting positive mental health, reducing stigma, and aiding recovery for each young person. To do this successfully, we must continue our collective efforts to actually listen to their needs and wishes and to tailor our service and our responses accordingly. I would like to assure you today of my commitment and that of government to building on the progress of recent years to improve all aspects of mental health legislation, policy and services. Despite the common and acknowledged challenges we all face, such as those around increasing expectations, COVID-19, staffing pressures, and I suppose also the amount of people that are now, the amount of people that are now, I suppose, presenting, um, more and more people are presenting for supports. Incremental and measurable progress has been made and will continue to be made across mental health. I would like to thank everyone here today for the important part they have played in this. I would like to take the opportunity this morning to briefly update you on some significant developments over the last year and to detail uh, further priorities. Good progress has been made on reforming the Mental Health Act 2001. This is a complex process that needs to take account of many factors, including feedback following extensive public consultation, linkages to the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act 2015, and relevant international commitments by Ireland. A mental health bill is now being prepared, as you're aware, and a pre-legislative -leg uh, scrutiny report was published on the 12th of October last. The Department of Health is currently working with the Office of the Parliamentary Council and the Office of the Attorney General to progress drafting of the bill. And following this, it will be introduced to the Oireachtas, and I have secured it as priority legislation um, after Christmas. So I am looking forward to progressing um, this really important bill as soon as possible. I'm also pleased to say that the budget for 2023 provides a record 1.2 billion euro for HSE mental health next year. And this includes the greatest increase of around 71 million in any one year. Uh, this significant investment will enable continued implementation of our national mental health policy, sharing the vision and connecting for life. And under the HSC service plan 2023, but working in partnership um, with all the organizations such as yourselves that we have uh, service level agreements with. It will enhance mental health supports across the board uh, from promotion, prevention and early intervention. Those three words we use every day, promotion, prevention and early intervention. And I suppose ensuring that people know that there is, um, you know, there is a way forward. One common interest, for example, we all share is the potential of digital technologies to complement traditional care, particularly around promotion and prevention approaches for young people. And it is also my priority to ensure that the HSE clinical programs continue to progress over the next year, as well as the specific models of care. These include self-harm and suicide related ideation, eating disorders, early intervention in psychosis, ADHD in adults and dual diagnosis, and I was delighted to visit one of the ADHD teams this year. We have made great progress since this was launched um, uh, 18 months ago. So we now have three teams in place with four more in train. And I was really struck by a 61 year old gentleman that I spoke to in relation to his ADHD diagnosis that he had never gotten one previously. He always felt that there was something not quite right. And now he can move forward and live his best life. And I do think it's so important to remember that at any stage in, in our lives, we can reach out for help. In the context of preventative and promotive, um, promotive approaches, in September, I launched a new CAMS um, ID model of service, and this will complement services provided by primary care, children's disability network teams, and CAMS for a more integrated and holistic approach. Listening to parents, there has been, and this has been a, um, a particular area where people have felt that they have their children have fallen through the cracks. And I do think children and adolescents with intellectual disabilities, they will have access to mental health services in the same way as all young people nationally. And I do believe it's very important that we have this dedicated pathway in place for them. The government, the HSE, and I myself continue to resolve issues when they occur, ensuring they're appropriately addressed and in line with best practice. So I refer to the situation um, in Kerry Cams that, that, that I have been dealing with all this year. 
And we have clearly committed to the full implementation of all the 35 recommendations of the Maskey report. And core to this is progressing the three national audits now underway arising from the Maskey report in relation to prescribing practice, compliance with CAMS operational guidelines, and qualitative research into service user experience. And I really felt it was so important that these um, national audits take place. But also, as you will be aware, we also await the outcome of the separate review into CAMS being conducted by the Mental Health Commission. And I want to thank the Mental Health Commission for their cooperation on this. I felt it was very important that the audit and the review would run in parallel. A lot of data will be made available um, to me when these reports are, are finalized. And I believe in order to progress the best care possible for our young people and our adolescents who are in the care of 73 CAMS teams throughout the country, I believe this will be invaluable information that we haven't had previously. And I do want to say, and I want to compliment the CAMS teams that work so hard on a daily basis, supporting young people, adolescents, and their parents um, as they travel through a very difficult and challenging time for children when they present with ill mental health. Um, I also want to say many of the Maskey recommendations have been in, uh, commenced or implemented, and I'm regularly updated on this. Um, as you'll be aware, in April, um, the government approved a compensation scheme for those identified as affected by the Maskey report. And I felt it was very important that this would happen very, very quickly, that it wouldn't drag on. And this scheme has been administered by the state's claims agency, and it is designed to provide full compensation in line with a court ruling. But without the stress for families and court proceedings, it is non-adversarial. And I thought that was so important. Um, these children have been true enough. Their families have been true enough. And I just felt as Minister for Mental Health, it was my priority to make sure. And I was delighted to get the full support of the Taoiseach and the Cabinet to ensure that this was put in place quickly, that it would be very fair, but that also it would be non-adversarial. A very significant and indeed historic milestone for the Irish Mental Health Service was the recent move of the HSE National Forensic Mental Health Service from Dundrum to Port Ran. This, which had been long called for by so many in the sector, replaces and expands the old central mental hospital. And indeed to have been there, I think it's two weeks ago now, um, um, two weeks ago today, um, that that move, that, you know, that it was officially opened and the move of, of, the, of, of the patients took place on the following Sunday safely and securely. Um, it's, it's very, very timely. It was badly needed. And this significant project with a capital cost of over 200 million euro will enhance our national forensic capacity from around 95 beds to 170 when Portran is fully operational. And this new forensic CAMS and ICRU, the new forensic CAMS unit and the ICRU are particularly welcome. And I believe it is one of the best forensic mental health facilities in the whole of Europe. Uh, you know, and I was really, really pleased that finally um, it's open now, it's operational, and um, that the patients have the patients and the staff have really good um, um, facilities, um, you know, to get the support and the help that they need. It was a major program in the program for government, you know, and it also underpins, um, it also helps underpin um, the, the Mental Health Act of 2001. Uh, the initiative has been widely welcomed across the health and judicial sectors and it complements another important development which was the publication in September last of the report of the High Level Task Force to consider the mental health and the addiction challenges of those who come in contact with the criminal justice sector. It is recognised internationally that vulnerable people with mental health and addiction challenges are overrepresented in our criminal justice system and we therefore we have a responsibility to ensure that as many as possible are diverted away from the criminal justice system and provided with health and social care supports appropriate to their, need, to their needs. And I want to thank former Minister Kathleen Lynch, who chaired this really important um, project. And we had huge cooperation between Minister, um, the Minister for Justice, Helen McEntee, the Minister for Health, um, Stephen Donnelly. Um, of course, myself was involved in Minister Frank Fien. And it was re it's a really, really important piece of work. But now we have to go forward, fund it and implement it. And that's what I intend doing. And it's a realistic and it's a grounded report that has potential to realise positive changes in the lives of some of the most vulnerable in our society. But to turn back to what today is all about, we should rightly remember on this occasion 
the great work and the great achievements of St. Patrick's over the years and celebrate in particular at this time, uh, Jonathan Swift's forthcoming birthday on the 30th of November. St. Patrick's continues in as so many ways to make an important contribution to mental health in Ireland. And this ranges from community and outpatient care in the Dean Clinics, today's services in the Wellness and Recovery Centre. And if I could take this opportunity, Paul, to thank you and all the staff over the last two and a half years, which has been the most difficult time. But I'm very, very proud of the fact that during the most difficult times of COVID, our mental health services stood up across the whole country. 85 to 90% of services were, remained intact. And I suppose the positive moves by many of you um, to, to bring out patient clinics, to, to, to move them online and to be able to support people in their own home is very, very important. And I suppose it's all about bringing the right care at the right time in the right place to people. A high quality multidisciplinary inpatient service continues at St. Patrick's University Hospital, Willow Grove Adolescent Centre and in Lucan. And the development, for example, of your home care service or those via remote access are indicative of your innovative approach. And I do want to compliment you on that. I also want to thank you for your range of community and outpatient care in the Dean Clinic, today's services at the Wellness and Recovery Centre. These are all really, really important. And I think bringing patient care front and centre to the person in their own community, in their own home, as often as we can, especially in relation to early intervention is key. Your well-deserved reputation stands testament to the ideals and the aspirations of Jonathan Smith Swift, and I would like to wish St. Patrick's continued success. It bodes well for your future contribution to advancing mental health care and advocacy in Ireland, including to many of the issues and initiatives I have outlined today. And I look forward to continuing our constructive engagements, um, our constructive um, interaction into the future. And I'm always only a phone call away. So Gaurav Mila Mahagov, congratulations and best wishes again for the next 12 months. Gaurav Mahagov, Minister. That's, I know I, we say this over the last three years, we said it every year, but really maybe 2023 will be the year we'll get to welcome you in person for Founders Day. <laughs> I feel like I, I hope I haven't jinxed it for the third time, but thank you so much for joining us this morning and um, have best of luck in Athlone for the rest of the day. Take care. Well, uh, Professor Paul Fearon will be back to introduce our keynote address from Professor Patrick McGarry in a while. But first, we're delighted now to welcome our first youth advocate speaker. Diana Chow, founder of Letters to Strangers, is joining us live from the US. So I'm not sure whether to say a very good late night, Diana, or a very good early morning. But thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm very pleased and honored to be here. Uh, and don't worry, it is late here, but actually I'm very used to this sort of kind of problematic sleep schedule. So I'll explain why that is the case actually in my speech, but Thanks, I appreciate it. All right, I'll go ahead and start by sharing my screen. So give me one second. All right, so if you guys have any issues with seeing my screen, feel free to unmute and let me know, but otherwise, I'll go ahead and get started. So thank you all so much for having me today. Um, I want to start by asking a kind of loaded question. What do you think of when you think of the word, word term mental illness? It's probably something that has a lot of nuance to it, but maybe I can break the ice by starting with my own story. So I think my story might be along the lines of what you could be imagining as an answer to this question. Uh, so a quick trigger warning for the next minute or so, this will be a quick summary, but I'm a first generation immigrant to the US from the poorest province of China. Uh, I grew up below the poverty line with parents who didn't speak English. And when I was 13 years old, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and later complex PTSD. Not long after I attempted suicide and I was saved by my younger brother on what is by far one of the worst days of my life. 
As you can imagine, uh, you know, especially given the circumstances, mental health care was not something that really existed in my vocabulary. So after a while of trying all sorts of different things, I ended up turning to writing. I wrote these letters to strangers. And as I wrote to people I never even met, I realized that I was being kind and empathetic to these people who I probably will never meet. So why couldn't I do the same for myself? You know, didn't I deserve the same for myself? I started to realize I have a voice and a story worth telling and that writing is humanity distilled into ink. So that is the very abridged origin story for why I ended up starting Letters to Strangers in my second year of high school. So when I was about 14 or so. And today we work to make sure that as few people as possible feel that same sort of gut shaking bone rattling pain that I had lived with for so long. So I'm very happy and proud that we are able to share our world's first youth for youth mental health guidebook and our teachers mental health curriculum guide, both of which are completely free to download digitally and the mental health guidebook was written entirely by 14 to 21 year olds from over 50 countries. So it is a huge book it's like almost 500 pages, but I think when you think about how nuanced this topic can be, that's kind of necessary. Um, I won't go too much into what exactly we do at Letters to Strangers, but I am just going to sum it up by saying that with our goal of destigmatizing mental illness, we have our three main pathways of our anonymous letter writing exchanges um, through chapters on school campuses or via the general public, um, our science based peer information. Uh, science-based peer education curricula, like you saw earlier, and our grassroots policy-based advocacy. So we are a global organization, which is why I am often awake at this time of day, um, just to deal with our international stuff. But I think that's an important thing to remember is that whenever we talk about mental health, we're talking about people and people are everywhere. So even though every culture, every community has its own unique issues, at the end of the day, mental health affects all of us. Of course, no story is linear. And even though my story and mine sort of fit somewhat the lines of what you would imagine a story could look like as an answer to that question I asked you earlier, um, it's not always quite so clear cut. And I didn't fully understand that myself until I discovered the concept of psychosomatic symptoms. These are physical manifestations of psychological distress. And for me, it happened the summer before I turned 14. Um, I was in the middle of a chemistry class during the summertime, and then all of a sudden my head started aching and pounding, and I thought elephants were stomping nails into my forehead. And within a few days, I was completely blind. I had lost my eyesight. And even though for the next four years, I would have gone to see basically every single doctor and specialist near me. And I did all these tests. No one could figure out what was causing me to go episodically blind. Turns out many years later, I was at this conference where I was sharing my story. And this Asian American ophthalmologist told me that maybe it's psychosomatic given that no one could figure out whatever was like a clinically diagnosable cause. <laughs> And I didn't believe her, the idea that this could be something that was triggered by the sheer mental stress I was living under. But I went off to college or university, uh, depending on where you are, uh, what you might call it. And my university offered free mental health care. So for the first time in my life, I was able to get consistent mental health care. I was able to have a medication regimen that ended up working for me. And miraculously, as my mental health got better, so did my eyes. I went from being in and out of the hospital for half of high school, at one point literally in a comatose state, to being eye episode free for the last four years. I was seriously starting to believe in miracles. But that's the thing, you know, psychosomatic symptoms, they hide in the shadows of stigma. And so, especially when you come from a culture or a community that might have a particularly heavy stigma against mental illness, it's like we hide the pain until our bodies throw a coup. You know, our brains are saying, hey, if you won't care for me up here, then let me remind you how I control everything down here. And so I used to joke around with my friends about how, you know, these were a selection of the eye drops that I was always on. And I would be like, oh, my eye drops are more colorful than yours. Not that I could see them, <laughs> but 
ultimately, the point was that mental health is health. And so everything that can affect our health can affect mental health as well. So that's when I realized just how important it is to really figure out what is the stigma that is causing us to hide our pains until it gets to this point. And the truth is that for a lot of us, the stigma gets compounded because of a cycle. See, hurt people hurt people. And we found that not just, and I'll say some American based stats here, but I will preface this by saying that I've done uh, research into similar types of statistics in other countries around the world, and it's basically been the same no matter where you look at that has these statistics. Um, so in the US, for example, in clinical practice settings, minorities are less likely than white patients to receive treatment that adheres to treatment guidelines. And for the most part, it's not because any system is you know, trying to tell the doctors to be racist or anything like that, but that the systems themselves were built at a time when minorities were not always treated as equal. And so you take a look at something like the diagnostic manual, the DSM, that is used as a golden standard for diagnosing mental illnesses around the world. In the DSM, they have something called uh, uh, culture bound syndromes, which are manifestations of mental illness symptoms that happen within particular groups of people, but basically code for non white cultures and communities of people. And so these culture bound syndromes are relegated to just the appendix of this huge book. And in the previous edition of the DSM, they were not mentioned at all. Now, whether or not culture bound syndromes exist or like are a real thing, it's a whole other conversation. But the point is, when you're using these criteria to diagnose people, and the way that they are exhibiting their pain is not necessarily reflected in what you're using to diagnose them with, that's a hard conversation to have. And so it's probably not surprising that, for example, just this year, there was a study commissioned by the NHS, let's look at the non-American statistics, uh, where the University of Manchester did a sweeping review and found that there was a devastating picture of a healthcare system still failing minority ethnic patients. Now, in a lot of households that come from these perhaps minority backgrounds, what you often hear is that mental illness is the result of a past sin, that it doesn't exist, that you're just being disrespectful and spoiled and you should just drink some herbal tea. And perhaps that mental illness is just a white people thing. Now, obviously that is not true, but the thing is that intergenerational trauma is real. And so a lot of the times when we are lacking in that intergenerational education and knowledge, that hurt that gets passed down becomes especially insidious. So for example, studies in recent years done on mice have found that when you have mice that are exposed to traumatic scenarios, the trauma-induced behavioral and molecular level changes can last up to five generations later, even after that first mouse and all subsequent offspring were mated with only quote unquote normal non trauma induced mice. Five generations. Obviously, humans are not mice, but I think it shows a point that intergenerational trauma is real. But I also believe that just as hurt people might hurt people, there has to be a second part to that statement. My addition to that is heal people, heal people. So I want to share with you some tips that I've learned over the years on how we can embark on that journey of healing. We don't have too much time, so I'll just very briefly uh, leave the slide up if you want to take any screenshots, but also know that any of this is available to finding our guidebook as well. Um, so you might have heard of the concept of love languages, and I would like to introduce to you, if you haven't thought about it, um, the idea of pain languages. And the acronym we use at Letters to Strangers is empathizing. So of course, any one of these is perfectly normal human things, but it's when they are done in an abnormal amount or in an abnormal combination for someone that that could be a sign that maybe you yourself or someone else could use a checking in. And once you have discovered that maybe you are feeling some amount of pain, well, how do you navigate that journey to heal? The acronym we use is simple. So S is for self-advocate, I is for increment. There's all of these steps, but a few I want to point out is that one, under self-advocate, I think the big thing that I learned was that this is not a zero-sum game. You're not in it to win other people over. You're in it to win yourself over first. And once I realized that even if people who were near me didn't necessarily understand or hear what I was going through, if I believed in myself first and I believed in the value of my own well-being, then that self-confidence will naturally lead others to believe in me more too. 
Not to say that they should have to wait for me to get to that point first before they care, but at the very least, that's what self-advocacy means for me, is to know, notice that I need to win myself over first. And under um, L for listen, I just want to add the concept of wait or why am I talking? Because I think the biggest hurdle that I hear about um, from people who want to help others but don't know how to get started is they are afraid that they don't know how to solve the other person's problems. But the truth is that you're not necessarily in this to be the knight in shining armor, which is a great thing. You don't have to slay the fire breathing dragon, right? Like your job is more to be a partner in crime of sorts, walking alongside them as they navigate the road that they themselves want to go on to heal. And that's where listening, truly actively listening, listening just to listen, not to respond, really comes in. And so years for educate and like you're doing now, taking the time to learn about these things really can make a big difference. And I think I only have a few minutes for a brief Q&A, but I'll leave it at that for now. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And I am very grateful for all of you for letting me be here and share with you some of my thoughts and learnings. Dan, Dan, thank you so much for, uh, for that um, uh, um, talk. When we were when we were originally constructing the program um, uh, for this Founders Day, we were originally thinking, um, first of all, we had to have young people uh, with experience of, of these issues uh, talking. We wondered, would we have a session? But we decided in the end, for a variety of reasons, that we would actually have the first and last speakers um, uh, uh, as, as younger people. And I think I think it'd be clear to all, all participants why exactly that was the right thing to do. Indeed, I'd go as far as to say that for any conference, um, when experts come together to talk about a particular issue, not having the voice of people who are affected by that issue you lose so much and I think that your talk is just evidence of that it was it was inspiring passionate heartfelt candid um I don't know if if um uh, I've got the chat thing on now um do, do, does anybody have a do would you like to take questions now Diana for um, a couple of minutes if anybody has any um sure. I, uh, I'll try and open my uh, Q&A and see we have no open questions at the minute um no pressure i know this is first thing in the morning for you all <laughs> but if, if anybody has any questions perhaps if they don't have them now um uh they might send them uh, they might leave them on the q a and we might find a way to get them to you if you were if you were open to that and um, yes um, i'm typing my um email in the um, the website in the chat right now so uh, that is wonderful I, I that's just come up there now so hopefully everybody has access to that and I, I think many of us will be will be accessing that link um uh purely even on the basis of your talk because it, it makes such common sense it's it's human it's um and, and it's your experience which which just makes everything you say much more powerful so thank you very much diana um, I appreciate it. And I will say I really appreciate the fact that you are including, you know, younger voices in these things. As I'm sure you all know, 50% of all lifetime cases of mental illness begin by age 14. So absolutely. it's something that's very important. And uh, someone asked what countries are letters to strangers um, operative in. We're in a lot of countries. It's like over 20, so I'm not going to list it off the top of my head. Um, but feel free to email me if you want to just see if we have a place in your country. That's great. Thanks, uh, Diana. Um, oh, well, I saw it, there's a question also in the Q&A, but I can type the answer to that because I think that's easier to type a URL response to. If that's okay, yes. That, um, it's, it's how can we download the booklet? Um, so uh, it's it's in the chat there, So, um, but, uh, but you can perhaps answer that. That's, yes, I will go ahead and do that. Um, thank you so much. Okay. Well, I would suggest perhaps that um, if, if it's okay with you, Dan, uh, thank you very much once again. We might move on to our keynote speaker. Um, Sounds great, perfect. Thank you, Diana. Um, so I'm delighted um, uh, to welcome Pat McGorry to give uh, this year's uh, um, keynote um, address. Um, for those of you who know Pat, I'm not going to go through his CV. Um, you'll all know him um, by reputation and by what he's achieved over the past, gosh, uh, several decades now at this stage. Pat. Um, for those of you who don't know him, um, I mean, obviously his, his CV is on, on your programmes. That sort of captures what he's done, um, which is which is immense um, and over such a long time. Um, it doesn't capture perhaps why he's been so successful. And of course, I'm, I'm going to speculate here, Pat, if you don't mind for a moment. I'm not going to um, go too far, but... Pat has been an absolutely indefatigable, calm, charismatic, um, 
pioneer and advocate of young people's <clears throat> health. Um, I remember him um, when I was junior in, in probably the early mid 90s um, talking at conferences about early intervention in psychosis. And, you know, those times are different from now. It, it wasn't a done deal in those days. Um, there were a lot, there was a lot of um, uh, controversy about um, the uh, uh, whether uh, early intervention worked, um, whether it was a drain on other services. And Pat often fielded those questions at conferences. And I suspect, I, I've never talked about this to you, Pat, but I suspect his main sort of axioms were, um, is it not a good thing to intervene early, uh, particularly in young people, to help prevent um, uh, the development of, of more serious mental illness? And is it not a good thing to provide better resources for young people for their mental health generally? And that seems, uh, certainly from looking on, to have guided everything he's done. I'm not sure that anybody else could have done, and, and over such a long period, uh, as, as much as Pat has in this field, and he's still doing it. He never misses an opportunity to advocate on behalf of younger people. Um, I suspect if you did a poll of uh, globally of everybody involved in this area, um, of who the most influential person has been over the past three decades, it would be Pat. So I, I won't say anything more, Pat. I probably embarrassed you enough. Um, I know you. you um, yeah. So I'll, I'm it just giving me great pleasure to introduce Pat uh, to give the, the the keynote address, and I hope you all enjoy it as much as I'm going to. Thanks, Pat. Oh, thank you, Paul. What a, what a lovely introduction, and and thank you so much for the privilege of speaking at the Founders Day, and and uh, and and a thanks to Paul Gilligan too, who I, I've met over the years too. And, and nice to see you there, Paul. And. Uh, it's it's great to be virtually in Dublin, even though I've been in Dublin three times this year already. So, so I wish I could be there again. But um, thanks thanks again for the for the invitation. Um, I noticed that the minister uh, is is uh, um, Mary Butler. Well, our, our health minister here in Australia is Mark Butler, and, so, and he was the minister for mental health previously. So um, I think there's another bit of synergy there actually. So um, I'm just going to try and share the screen if I can. Um, yeah, here we go. So is everyone able to see that, 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 uh, that title slide? Yes, Pat. Oh, that's good. That's great. So Paul asked me to talk about, I suppose, like a bit of a global perspective on, 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 um, <clears throat> on these, what, what's really a paradigm shift. And, and uh, Ireland's playing a positive role here. But, you know, listening to the minister, I, I think a lot more could be done. And, and uh, without being rude <laughs> to her, I, I, she's probably gone anyway, but um politicians have been very important in 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 uh i suppose um driving these reforms and and um i'm going to talk a little bit about that too what role they can play and what we can all play too so um before i do though i just want to say you know i have i have given the founders lecture before um, probably about 10 of 10 years ago maybe or maybe a little bit less and i uh, got feel a bit of a connection with the place through my great friend and colleague patty power who um worked with us for a good decade in, <clears throat> in Melbourne uh, in the really foundational years that Paul was referring to about early intervention psychosis. Then he went to London and, <clears throat> and then he came back to Ireland, a bit like Tony Clare, who went back to to uh, Ireland from, from London after a, a hugely successful career. And I, when I was in Dublin this year, I managed to, to buy this book uh, written by Brendan Kelly about uh, Tony Clare. And it's a fascinating read. I'm sure you've all read it, but um, I, I just finished reading it myself. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to make those few remarks before I jump into it. And uh, so this is, this is I think, it was developed this slide at the time when Paddy went back to, to, to Dublin. So um, we have got a connection between Australia and, and, and Ireland, a very strong one, which I'll allude to a bit later. Of course, having been born in Dublin myself, I feel it's an especially strong connection personally. So mental Ill illness, as, as I'm... You know, um, the, the the young lady who spoke first emphasised in a beautiful way, and Paul and, and uh, the minister did too. It's it's the number one threat to, to to young lives and futures here in Australia. It's the number one cause of death of, of young people, um, and it's a big, a very prominent cause of death in Ireland. I'm not sure if it's number one or number two, but it's certainly right up there. <clears throat> and that's just the death rate, um, the kind of uh, erosion of of, um, of of futures and and even of the, of the society itself is is very very profound, and that leads to this concept of mental wealth and and why, you know, it, it's not just a competition about the humanity of investing in in mental health care compared to cancer or COVID or anything else, um, 
but we usually lose out in that competition, even though we've got we've got an equal case in terms of humanity and, and, and burden of disease, stronger perhaps, but we've got a much stronger economic case because the return on investment for investing in, in mental health care, especially early intervention in young people, is, is huge. And if you just look at the World Economic Forum data here from over a decade ago, <clears throat> mental ill health, mental illness, Reduce is some. It's the main sort of eroder of, of GDP of, of, among the non-communicable diseases. It's, it's it's more important slightly than cardiovascular disease, and it's twice as important as cancer, which we spend in Australia about thirty percent of our health budget on cancer treatment and about seven percent on mental health. But it's not a very smart thing to do economically to have that imbalance. Now, I'm not saying you should spend less on cancer, but you should spend a hell of a lot more on mental mental illness. And you would get that money back many times over. So that, that those are the facts, which for some reason, politicians are able to not act on these facts. And, and I'll touch on why that might be, you know, um, later on, because it, it's not like, as, as you can see, listening to the minister this morning, it's not like they don't accept the premise. It just doesn't get executed. So it's the same slide, actually, I, I won't repeat that. And the World Bank, even 25 years ago, were onto this, and that they, they basically said that the, the young person on the threshold of productive life, the 22-year-old, who society has invested hugely in to get to that point of productive life, the threshold, is much more important than the, than the young child, actually, in terms of um, you know, the cost effectiveness and, and, the, and the value to the society. So that's why they waited the value of a life lived in terms of calculation of burden of disease much more heavily than older people. Uh, and this interesting uh, ethical challenge now with COVID where we've spent a fortune on saving the lives of older people. Um, and, and yet, you know, and emotionally you'd think a two-year-old would be much more valued in this sort of metric. But in fact, hard-nosed economists value the, the young person, the, the, the emerging adults very, very highly. And this, this is because of this concept of mental wealth, where you're building up the social capital and investment in that young person. It's the, it's the love of the parents and the, and, the, and the education, and it's the support of the, of the community to get that person to that threshold stage. If they don't end up returning on investment, in other words, if they, um, if they die, worst case scenario, um, or if they become disabled and end up on welfare, which is a very significant risk for serious mental illnesses, which emerge at this stage of life. Um, or if they just underachieve because of mental Ill, Ill health, their main health problem, 50% of the burden disease in this age group is, is mental Ill, Ill health. Then it's a disaster, not just in human terms, but in economic terms as well. But it's strange that this argument has not actually resulted in proportionate investment in mental health care. In fact, there's still underinvestment everywhere in the world and, and especially even within a health system that the, the youth the youth phase this emerging adult phase adolescence young adulthood is is the least heavily invested in which why you why you have problems like you like the minister referred to in the Kerry cams and 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 the kind the way the cams are just buckling all around the world under the under the force of this demand so so this is a serious problem a serious public neglect issue and the young people are just ending up on the scrap heap in, in much bigger numbers than they need to. Uh, I think, um, is it Emily, the first speaker? I, I just forgotten, I apologize, I've forgotten her first name, but she spoke beautifully. She talked about the age of onset, 50% of onsets, and probably that's just mild symptoms, actually, in many cases by age 15. But the full force of morbidity is really from puberty through to the mid-20s, uh, if you're talking about... Um, adult type persistent, you know, potentially chronic illnesses. And they're the adult type illnesses. Obviously, there are a number of less prevalent illnesses like ADHD, autism that, are, that begin in earlier childhood, but the bulk of the adult type problems really surge through from puberty. And that's what we see here on this, this slide. This is the incidence curve <clears throat> for burden of disease. There are mental disorders in younger children, as I, as I say, but they're lower, much lower prevalence than in adolescence and, and uh, early adulthood, the peak being in the early 20s. which is So it's the worst possible time to have a, a, a transition of service at, around age 18, which we still have this paediatric adult model in specialist services, which is right there. 
and so the service the, the system is weakest where it needs to be strongest right at the point that the the prevalence the incidence and prevalence are surging and you can see that you know as a proportion of, of incidence in later life physical illnesses takes over mental illnesses have become less common in terms of incidence but of course if, if they if they have started in in, uh, in emerging adulthood and they haven't been treated effectively then they they persist with chronicity across all of those decades so <clears throat> that's the same idea and Kat, Moffat and Caspi did the, wrote this great paper about three or four years ago um, in JAMA Psychiatry which showed that the opportunity is there if you treat these mental illnesses in young people which are very prevalent properly the chance is there to reduce the morbidity of, of, of medical illnesses later on Me mental disorder early in life is a massive risk factor for 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 later onset um degenerative diseases of all kinds and and uh so they they make this point very beautifully in a, in a two-page paper in JAMA Psychiatry so I recommend you read that one <clears throat> then of course there's, there's there is the developmental impact of of having mental ill health during this transition and 50 percent of young people from a, the Dunedin cohort study 50 percent of young people between beginning of pro, uh, secondary school and the age of 30 50 percent will have have had a period of diagnosable need for care mental ill health and if, if that happens it, it it causes developmental delay and maturational delay so it's, even though normal young people without mental ill health still are, are late maturers these days as we all know sociologically it's changed a lot that the process of becoming a mature adult and, and um so hence the term emerging adulthood to replace adolescence um but if you do have this mental Ill health it, it 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 slows you up even further so um this is a german slide from professor fegert from ulm in germany but same sort of idea that we talk about now then there's the embarrassing fact that societies through the ages and, and and even even more so in the last decade or so neglect young people and this is a great quote from john gunn the uh, english forensic psychiatrist and and um basically points out the neglect of adolescent psychiatry is a special form of self-harm under, undertaken by adult society and that is still happening uh, and that young people are feeling it you know that we get a raw deal this is from uh, like a qualitative survey done earlier this year and, and was published in the conversation in in, in australia <clears throat> we get a raw deal and they're pessimistic about their futures for paul alluded to this in, in his introduction i think um the world is not a very secure place for for this generation of young people and and, and it's not just climate change it's financial insecurity it's wealth transfer from young people to old people um it's even COVID where where the, the health of old people this might be a bit controversial but the health of old people was prioritized over the health of young people and um they have borne the, the heavy consequences of of, the, of this measures necessary to, to contain the pandemic so this contempt for young people or denigration of young people was highlighted in in a book called, um, called generations published earlier this year by Bobby Duffy the professor of public policy where he's looking at the differences between different sequential generations like millennials gen gen x gen y gen z all of that so his conclusion is that there's more similarities between the generations than not but he did make this point which we definitely have seen and, and it's just not a, an attitude it's it's translated into policy public policy as well um this is fairly hot off the press um yeah adolescent well-being urgent global priority by this group of authors the U.S. Surgeon General speaking um, uh, in an advisory to the president last December described a youth mental health crisis and very articulately described the huge challenges and um, and the effect on the mental ill health on the mental health of young people as devastating. So there's a recognition and awareness at the highest levels that this is a serious public health crisis. And I won't go into all the factors that are driving it. These are candidate factors. Some of them have got a lot of evidence behind them. Some, it's not clear. I would say social media is, a, is one that where a lot of people believe that's a, a major <clears throat> disabling factor, but but um, or, or pathological factor. But but that has to be properly um, proven, I think, or, or or understood. Here in Australia, we've just done the first national mental health survey with very top quality methodology it's a 
you know, proper diagnostic interview based community survey across the lifespan from 16 up. And what we've seen is um, a, a jump in prevalence um, from 2007 when the last <clears throat> survey was done. The prevalence in the 16 to 24 age group in 2007 was 26%, which was already pretty, pretty scary because that was the highest across the lifespan. But now in 2021, we see 40% of young Australians have experienced mental illness in, 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 the, in the past year, according to diagnostic criteria. And that's a rough approximation for need for care, uh, maybe not all heavy duty need for care, but certainly some sort of um, therapeutic response or professional response, and particularly so in young women. And the, and the rise between 2007 and 2021 in young women was much sharper than in young men. Um, so, and that's been associated with a rise in deliberate self-harm in, in young women as well in, over that period. So this is that jump of, of, of a 50% rise in prevalence across 15 years. If that was happening in any other illness category, like diabetes or cancer or um, you name it. Um, and of course, we didn't survey the younger adolescents where, where there's, there are also very worrying signs too, nor, nor, nor younger children. But just looking at that, if that was happening in any other health area, there'd be major alarm and uh, decisive action. And we haven't seen that yet. Um, from Denmark, we were just at the International Youth Mental Health Conference in Denmark in October. Um, and very similar increases and, and, and more rapid rises of mental ill health in, in this um, in exactly the same age group than in older age groups. Although you do see a rise in prevalence across other lifespans too, but particularly in this younger age group. And this is data from the Lancet um, from November last year, pandemic data from all around the world showing a rise in anxiety and depression across the lifespan actually in this case, but much more sharply there, as you can see in young, in young people and particularly in young women. So, you know, this is this is typically what has been happening in, in mental health care around Australia and, and in other parts of the world, you know, too little, too late and the wrong timing. And when we first started reforming in this space, this is the, what the young people were telling us. They they didn't like what we were offering, particularly whether it was CAMS or whether it was adult services. And they weren't designed. They certainly weren't co-designed or co-produced with the the the, um, the wisdom of young people and families and they were really very old-fashioned and, and and clunky and even though we were we were probably promoting messages of you know anti-stigma seek help you know greater tolerance early intervention when it came to the reality it was very hard to access and i know in ireland that that's that's um it's been the same sort of issue and of course Try, as Paul was alluding to, try to get reform in mental health. It's like wading through quicksand. You know, it really is. The inertia of our system is is probably worse than the, than the the inertia that we see in other parts of the health system. Partly because we're so underfunded, and um, the the needs are so much uh, overwhelming the the existing sort of models of care. But but our mindsets are not very optimistic. Um, and, and they're, they're hyper skeptical, you know, I think Paul alluded to this, I, I certainly found that um, um, in the early days of the early psychosis reforms, and, and, and we were desperately committed to, to producing evidence, but the evidence was never enough for some people, because they were just trained to, to just, you know, find pick holes in, in things and just not really see the big picture. That's changed because the evidence has got so strong and, and clear, I guess, but there's still more work to do, and we've got a lot more improvements we can make. So anyway, so what it needs is paradigm shifts of various kinds. So early intervention, the concept of early intervention in psychiatry is, is a paradigm shift in itself, <clears throat> but it's closely um, what, syn synergistic with the idea of a youth mental health zone or system, which has to be culturally different from a child oriented system for younger children, you know, the pre-pubertal children. Um, they just don't fit in the same waiting room um, and, and that they've got a different perspective on life and the different developmental issues, different disorder types, different mixes of professionals needing needed to look after them. And then the young adults have got a lot in common for developmental and also for, um, you know, um, epi reasons as well. So that's the proposition, those two pillars. <clears throat> and enhanced primary care was the first focus. The other paradigm, apart from that developmental one and, and the epidemiological one, is, is the early intervention idea. 
and in, in 2007, <clears throat> reluctantly in some ways, we started a journal because we didn't think early intervention psychosis was enough to justify a separate journal, but certainly early intervention across the, the lifespan and across the diagnostic spectrum was. And uh, that's been pretty successful. It's um, It's gone to six issues a year in the last year or two, publishing a lot of papers, impact, impact factor rising slowly, and certainly a lot more uh, work done in other diagnostic groups beyond psychosis. So <clears throat> it's, it's achieving a... I suppose, a, 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 a vehicle for evidence-based work to flourish and, and to, to, to drive the field on an evidence base or evidence basis. Um, so looking at Australia, this is actually not in Australia, this sculpture is outside the, the London School of Economics in London, where my son was a student. So I came across this one day, I couldn't believe what I was seeing, but um, uh, it's, we, it's, it's a nice picture of the world. And so what we began with was the idea that <clears throat> we had to modernise our front end, you know, of, of youth mental health care, we had to make it much higher volume. And we had to actually put things on deck that met the basic needs of, of the early stages of, um, of mental Ill health in this adolescent young adult age group. <clears throat> and this was this was, but the modernization was 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 achieved through um, input of young people, as well as people working in the field and families. And there had to be a few key elements and things like you know, GPs, you know, so general practitioners, who, so so that um, the primary care is a primary care model and therefore high volume, psychological or, or me mental health uh, special professionals had to be there. Um, Paul mentioned uh, digital mental health, that that, that has had to be a feature as well. Uh, awareness programs, uh, education of the community, vocational recovery, drug and alcohol is not on this this slide, but that was another key element that had to be some expertise available, family support, and of course, youth, youth participation. So those were the elements that we thought were important, it led to the creation of, of um, something called Headspace, which you've probably heard of some of you, um, a brand, a, a, a which what became a trusted brand. <clears throat> Communities basically were brought, were mobilized to support and advocate for these services to be spread in, within those, those communities. Um, and this is what it looks like in different parts of Australia. So, so you've got um, Swan Hill in northern Victoria there, Coffs Harbour on the coastal of New South Wales, and then I think Darwin is the bottom one, uh, the bottom right-hand one. So it's 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 um so these are the sort of things I think I mentioned that would be expected in, in one of these centres. Um, of course, it's free. It's it, it, um, including the GP care um, because they bulk bill, as we say. So there's no co-payment. That's made it difficult to recruit staff. Um, that's that's one of the financial flaws in the model, but something we're trying to address with government now. So, mentioned digital. Well, there's a there's a program called Most Moderated Online Social Therapy, which is very comprehensive and complex mixture of um, um, guided journeys um, of coping and, and other sorts of therapy um, with a positive psychology slant. Um, a social network so so young people can support each other and, and and also in particular diagnostic groups and and finally peer moderation and clinical moderations so that um so that people can get um it, um real-time support if, particularly if there's a, if there are more acute problems e-headspace is another um sort of digital pro sort of program provided by headspace national and so it compares with other forms of mobile apps, e-treatments. It's, it's much more comprehensive. Uh, and it's, it's meant to be integrated with face-to-face -face care, not, not as an alternative to it. That's another key feature. Yeah. So then, of course, you know, beyond the primary care level, and this is where some kind of restructured re CAMS adult sort of system, but with a youth stream um, would come in where... so. For, for what we call the missing middle, the people, the young people who are more complex or persistent in this age group with um, with longer term needs and more complex needs and who need multidisciplinary team based care and lots of other components, you have to build the next tier of care sitting behind and, and integrated with the primary care front door. And that's what the other things in the, yeah, you know, we use the iPhone because that's the kind of engaging interface that young people could have a relationship with. It doesn't mean that we do everything through an iPhone, but but um, the, the concept or the, or the, the, um, the kind of uh, culture of, of the iPhone and the relationship is the thing we were trying to modernize, I suppose. So the, these are the sort of diagnostic streams that we 
would want to see in the more specialized level of care. Um, these are the broad categories that we see as, as the most important. And obviously there's overlap between these. And so there are comorbidities. So while you need some specialist expertise in these areas, um, the, the actual real life people don't fit neatly into these categories as, as I think um, speaker, first speaker was talking about. So Headspace is now in 152 locations and will be in 164 locations across the country by 2023. Began in 20, 2006 with 10 centers. And you've seen the same thing in Ireland with Jigsaw, which I'll come back to in a minute, where you start off with a small number of centers. And because they work, other communities want these things to be put in place as a front door and a, and a first port of call. It, it's, it's, it's very politically powerful um, because, because communities want this and it's a solution, uh, it, albeit a partial one, it's only an initial and the first tier on the ladder. Um, Politicians want to be associated with it. Um, and these are a collection of our prime ministers up until the last one who, who uh, got kicked out in May this year. Uh, the new one is, 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 is also supported, but we haven't got a picture of him yet. But so we're going back to, to John Howard in 2004, who was the first one, and then Kevin Rudd, Malcolm Turnbull, um, Julia Gillard, Tony Abbott, and uh, Scott Morris, all very supportive. So we published a lot of papers on this. Um, in, this one's in the Medical Journal of Australia, describing outcomes, describing the, the, the types of patients that present um, and um, the social outcomes. What we found is that the outcomes are good for a subset, and it's somewhere between a third and two thirds, depending on you know, what you define as a good outcome. So there's benefit for a substantial proportion of patients, but there's also a significant proportion that do not benefit because the episodes of care are too short, the team is too basic or too thin for the complexity of the cases. And um, so there's a, there's a missing piece, which we call the missing middle. And a lot of young people are falling into that, that hole between the primary care level and what's a, what, the, what the specialist services can provide. And, and I know that's exactly the same situation in Ireland too. Um, so Headspace has been through three independent evaluations, all you know, generally positive. This was the second one. The second one focused on access, which was greatly improved. So that's that's a no brainer. These sort of stigma free, well branded services provide very good, you know, stigma free access. Um, also because they're you know, there's a lot of youth input into them as well, and we have youth peer workers and all of that as well. So this is the most this is the most recent evaluation, which actually shows that Headspace is not only ineffective for that group, but it's cost effective overall. Um, now, some Headspaces in remote areas with low numbers of patients are not so cost effective, but but overall, the program nationally is was was given the the big tick of cost effectiveness, which you know. Now, this evaluation didn't highlight some of the financial weaknesses of the model because it it it, it definitely could be strengthened and, and could perform better. But in general, it, it's assured the sort of um, the safety and, and, and actually acted as a shield for some of the critics that Paul was referring to before. So these are some of the types of services that, uh, that are provided. There's not enough medical input. Um, GP input is, 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 is too weak. It's, it's sort of, so it's mainly mental health professionals and they're, and they're fairly basic ones. They're fairly, they're, they're clinical psychology providing somewhere between 10 and, and 20 sessions a year. So, and the average number of sessions per, per client is about five or six. So it's not a intensive model. And there's a very little psychiatrist input, even though that is possible, there's no reason not to, if we could recruit the psychiatrist to actually function in a, in a, through fee-for-service uh, models uh, funded by Medicare. So anyway, so that's the snap that you can, that you can see this, this, the cost effectiveness data on the right, which is all in the right quadrant there. So in terms of other countries upscaling youth mental health, it's all very well to have a great model of care or something that works, but how do you get it? How do you spread it? You know, I mean, the cancer people don't seem to have any trouble. If, if there's an advance in cancer, it, it permeates the system fairly quickly. But in mental health, we've had trouble um, delivering evidence-based care, even when we have, when we've actually um, uh, got the evidence to, to show that it works. And, you know, in, in Australia, I think only 50% of people with mental illness overall get access to care and only 15% of that mental health care is truly, you know, evidence-based. So 
So, if, so there's a lot of uh, effort required on in, in improving quality and uh, and I suppose delivering a, an evidence-based models and content. So we've written about um, this uh, um, about the scaling up in different parts of the world. And that that was the first paper I think in 2014 in World Psychiatry. Then there's another one, a whole supplement of Medical Journal of Australia summarising the international um, progress, including Ireland, uh, with Joseph Duffy being a co-author there um, from Jigsaw. So about 12 countries have actually developed this entry-level primary care sort of model like Jigsaw or Headspace. Some of them are thinner than others and some of them more volunteer-based. Some of them like Jigsaw don't have doctors or GPs particularly. So all of them could be stronger, these entry-level programs, but they're, they're a start. They're a very promising start. And the big thing about them all is that they are focused on the correct age range for this, which is the puberty to the mid-20s, roughly <clears throat> 12 to 25 just that general zone. Um, our most recent paper was published this year as a, as a sort of focal paper for a, for a series of perspectives uh, or, or commentaries. Um, so this des des described the designing and scaling up integrated youth mental health care uh, or integrated youth services as they're called in, in, in Canada. So if you wanna read about it, there's, that's, a, that's a very comprehensive summary of, of, of world progress. Um, so this is some pictures of that world progress. This is a headspace in Denmark, which was the host for the IOMH, the International Association of Youth Mental Health Conference um, in October. It's, it's mainly volunteer based. It needs a lot more clinical investment to make it really, um, I think more than just a thin green line, but it's still there in quite a number of locations across Denmark, um, mainly funded initially through philanthropic funding. Um, so government needs to come to the party there in, 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 in Denmark. Uh, the foundry in British Columbia, there was a very successful summit you know, meeting of, over a couple of days, including a very good session at Farm Lee in Dublin, just before the IOMH between foundry, headspace and jigsaw, um, a lot of sharing of knowledge and experience. So foundries in British Columbia, very similar model. Uh, Access Canada, and these are some of the pioneers and funders of Access Canada. Um, uh, other provinces involved as well. So Canada is very progressive as well in this space. At ease in the Netherlands, um, again, pretty volunteer based this one as an entry level, there are psychiatrists involved, but um, university students play a key role as, as, as entry level sort of uh, volunteers. And it's in a few locations in Netherlands. Headspace in Israel, um, funded with Australian money, but operating in Israel in two locations. In France, completely independently, a thing called Maison des Adolescents um, is in 104 departments. Um, I'll come back to the picture of France in a minute. Then there's Jigsaw in Ireland, of course, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. And I think that the issue here is how do we bring this, which is now funded by the HSE, how do we bring this entry level portal in much better approximation and alignment with the specialist mental health system and reforming the specialist mental health system so it's the right age range to mesh with it with the, the jigsaw now i'm sure you'll have a lot of debate amongst yourselves about that one but um that's the, the stumbling block in many countries how do you get beyond this pediatric model which doesn't really work for the adolescents and young adults um while preserving the the you know the the, the benefits that the minister were talking about within the cam system for the younger children and obviously cams clinicians might have a role in this re re restructured new system in victoria I'll, I'll mention this before i finish we have restructured our cams or kim system into two zones 0 to 11 and 12 to 25 and that is going to be very exciting as we integrate those services with the headspace centers across victoria so this is the origins of of um jigsaw originally headstrong with it's a uh, very poetic uh, CEO, Tony Bates. Um, um, that's the, the, the first meeting at UCD in 2006 with a young man called Matthew Hamilton, who had helped us with the federal government of Australia to lobby for headspace here. And then he went back and persuaded Declan Ryan and the One Foundation to fund something similar in Ireland. And, and that, that's how Jigsaw came into being. And then they hired Tony later on. And, and uh, Jigs Jigsaw has obviously expanded and grown. Um, to a, to a reasonable extent since then. And um, I think it's got a lot of support from, from various governments. And um, that's Deirdre Mortel, who was the CEO of the One Foundation, who, uh, who was 
key at that time. Barbara Dooley from UCD played a key role in, in, in um, many aspects of the development of Jigsaw and, and uh, particularly surveys in relation to young people. And that's one of the former Taoiseachs there in the Kenny opening the Jigsaw in Galway, which is an absolutely, you know, um, what's the word? Uh, Holy Grail type facility. It was a, just a beautiful facility with, and functioned very, very well under, under the leadership of a guy called John Fitzmaurice, who was an excellent, excellent manager. Um, that's it. Yeah, so I think this is out of date. So there, there are more jigsaws than that now, um, but they should be everywhere, really, um, and as the entry portal for this 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 age group. And GPs somehow must 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 need, need, um, if possible, be integrated with them. And then the backup system redesigns, as I mentioned. Now, I just mentioned a couple of other things. We've got great collaborations with people in Dublin, Mary Cannon and and and, uh, and David Cotter from RCSI around research and also around reform. And um, um, we've, we've had some excellent sort of uh, <clears throat> um, exchanges and and discussions over the years. Just want to acknowledge that, and also the fact. That that Ireland is the, is the world first because it's the first country to actually create a, a faculty in its college of youth psychiatry. We've been trying to do that for, for over a decade in Australia, and we're still not quite there yet. We have training programs for youth psychiatry, which is distinct from CAMS training, but we haven't got the over the line politically to get the, the college to sort of validate or mandate this. And, and you have achieved that in Ireland, so and we're very jealous. So this is France. There's there's 104 of these Maison des Adolescents in France. Um, same age range. I think it's about 11 to 25, actually, not not 12, but um, almost the same. The problem there is that it's not. It, it doesn't have um, a defined template of what has to be provided in a centre. So you can't measure fidelity, program fidelity. It's very variable depending on <clears throat> on, on on the actual platform. So there's not much central control. Um, over the licensing or trademarking of, of the actual franchise, if you, if you can if you can use that word. In England, there, there there are sporadic outbursts of youth mental health, but not very not very well developed or sustained. In the US, it's even more embryonic. Um, so there are there's a thing called Alcove in Northern California, which um, is linked to Stanford University, and um, but otherwise. The US took about 20 years to catch up with early psychosis services, um, which they, they are now doing thanks to the Obama government. Um, there are early psychosis services rolled out across all states now in, in not complete coverage, but much more ex extensive, but they're still not really, you know, players yet in the youth mental health world. South Africa, in, some innovative health promotion programs uh, for young people with, with mental ill health here, surfing programs, obviously. The World Economic Forum in, in Davos made mental health a, a, a sentinel pro program and youth mental health was one of the four key programs that they supported with their brand. We had to find the money, but we, we were contracted at, or, at Origin, uh, uh, my service and, and <clears throat> institute in, in, in Melbourne to actually produce a global framework for youth mental health, which um, we did do through consultation, extensive consultation with people from many, many countries um, and it's fit for purpose as a model or, or a set of principles and guidelines for low and middle income as well as high income countries. And these are some of the key principles which are pretty obvious and we've been talking about them. And the idea is that you have a locally operationalized model, which is primary care focused. Um, and that's feasible, at least in middle income countries as well as high income countries, but it has to be developed in association or in congruent with local health financing and local cultural and other sorts of factors. So it has to be locally initiated and led to really work. Um, and that's what's happened with the companies that have developed these models so far. This was launched by our, our premier in Victoria, this model. Um, we, um, it was in the middle of COVID, so it had to be done online. Our premier is up for re-election tomorrow, actually. Um, he's been a great supporter of mental health care in this state and the one behind these major reforms and investment in and restructuring that we that I mentioned earlier. So I mentioned the backup system. This is a paper by Jay Shah, which is in press in Lancet Psychiatry, looking at different options for the more specialized multidisciplinary backup to the primary care systems um, uh, around the youth mental health model. And it's definitely, you know, a much more... <clears throat> 
of a, of a detailed blueprint for that level of care. And that's what uh, psychiatry is finalizing with us a commission on youth mental health, which will come out hopefully next year. Um, we've had the IOMH, I mentioned the International Association for Youth Mental Health. It's, it was formed in 2010 and um, has had six conferences so far, the most recent in Denmark. And it's a, it's a worldwide platform of, for reform with an international declaration mostly written by young people. And it was written in Kalani in Ireland, that first one, with targets. We had the, I think it was the third, no, the fourth international conference was in Dublin in 2017. Um, the most recent one I mentioned in Copenhagen. <clears throat> and so just beginning to wrap up, um, what are the residual issues that we need to think about? Obviously, more awareness, anti-stigma, an authorizing environment for reform, um, like we've just had in Victoria. Um, I don't think you've got that in Ireland yet, listening to the minister, uh, with apologies to her. It hasn't come through it as, a, as a practical priority with, with affirmative action and, and preferential investment for this much it's this very needy age group, which is getting worse. The mental health of young people is getting worse in this age group, which is not the case for, for other parts of the lifespan, as far as we know. So we need population level data um, and much more frequent surveys than just every 15 years, as we've been doing. We need much, much more research. We need a fair go in research. We don't get a fair go in medical research. It's the same as the, as the care system. We are discriminated against in the medical research world in terms of the, you know, the allocation of funds proportional to the burden of disease. Um, workforce, that's a massive problem. Even when we expand the funding for services like we're doing now, we, we, we haven't got workforces that are of the right size or, or quality um, to actually drive these reforms. So that's another rate limiting step. Primary care with specialist backup, I've talked about that a lot. Digital enhancement, um, that's obviously vital for the, these generations of digital natives that we're trying to treat. Um, telehealth, the pandemic obviously opened that door in a good way. And I think expertise and early intervention for the emerging serious mental disorders that we that I mentioned before, and global collaborative partnerships. We're not going to have a paradigm shift unless there are like-minded people all around the world working together on this problem. And Ireland's been a great partner for us with some of the people in the audience, you know, playing a very, very key role. So, and there are younger psychiatrists in Ireland who are, who are definitely, you know, very impressive emerging leaders in this space. So we hope to be, I had a meeting today with the Irish ambassador in Dublin, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in, in Canberra, but he was visiting our facility in, in Melbourne and, you know, was stressing how important the, the partnerships we've had over the years with Ireland have been. And he was very interested to hear about that. So um, that's just a coincidence. So I've probably gone slightly over time, Paul, for which I, I very much apologize, but I hope it, I hope that's um, given people a bit of a snapshot about the momentum, but the incredible challenge and urgency about what we have to deal with um, going forward. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And again, it's been a great privilege to be here with you today virtually. Thank you so much for that, Professor McGurry. That was really, really interesting. And I'm sure many of our attendees will have questions for you. There's been some already ranging from psychiatric genetics to social media impact. So we'll we'll get onto those just to let everybody know that Pat will be joining the panel discussion at the end of the research session. So if you have any questions, please do submit them via the Q&A box. But for now, Pat, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. So just something to mention as well that I may not have um, alluded to earlier, given some of what we've been discussing already this morning and what we may be discussing later, there is some support information shared in the chat if, if you need that. Now, as Professor Fearon alluded to when talking to Diana earlier, a really important factor when organizing this year's conference was to ensure that the views and perspectives of young people were included throughout the day and to that end, we have short videos that will play throughout the breaks that highlight some key views from young people in relation to the biggest challenges they feel are affecting youth mental health, as well as ways in which they think youth mental health can be supported. Now, these videos, they'll play continuously through the breaks. So perhaps when you're grabbing a coffee, you can catch those and see some of those key challenges young people are experiencing and their opinions on supports all in their own words. So. We'll be back here in about 10 minutes time when our research session will begin. So for now, thanks and see you in 10 minutes.
Hi everybody, you're very welcome back. I've added a layer, it's nippy in Dublin this morning. Um, I hope you all got a nice cup of tea and a bit of a comfort break. So now we're gonna get straight into it with our research session. And just a reminder, continue to ask your questions in the Q&A section and we'll have those for the panel discussion at the end, which our keynote speaker will also join. So first up in this research session, we're delighted to be joined by Mary Cannon, Professor of Psychiatric Epidemiology and Youth Mental Health in the Department of Psychiatry at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and consultant psychiatrist at Beaumont Hospital in Dublin. Good morning, morning Mary, and thanks for joining us. Are you there, Mary? Yes, yes I'm, oh, I'm here. There. Sorry, my, my, camera, all, my camera fell down. <laughs> That's okay. Don't worry. Okay. These things happen. Thank you. <laughs> Great. I'll, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just go ahead then. Um, great. Uh, thank you very much for the invite um, today. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I'd like to talk about a bit about prevention, but also about uh, the gaps, um, as I say, mind, mind the gaps that are in our uh, services for young people. Um, basically, uh, sorry, I'll just full, full screen on this. Uh, yeah. And um, I'm delighted, to say, to be here today. Um, the, the background context, I think, has been very well set, uh, set out by Pat, but I suppose just to, to highlight the fact that our services are very... Um, very much siloed, sectioned off into different uh, parts of the of the age range. For instance, our early intervention services deal with young people up to about age, about age five, um, and then then child and adolescent psychiatry uh, looks after young people up to about the age of eighteen, and then uh, adult psychiatry comes in from eighteen up to up to sixty five, and then we have the uh, psychiatry of old age from from sixty five onwards. So, I suppose what what the problem is that this fails to take account of the fact that really we're dealing with the same a, a person going through a lifespan um and you know each of these services has um has gaps um so people can't move seamlessly from one to the other and this is very frustrating for you know for for people trying to use the services from families but also for 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 health professionals also um so each of these you know there are gaps between each of these services and if people don't uh make a good transition or uh, get over the gap successfully uh problems problems can emerge so uh, as Pat mentioned in his excellent uh, presentation, this is uh, the classic graph showing that the burden of incidence of mental disorder falls precisely in that uh, young youth um, youth age from 15 up to about 25, um, and it, which is precisely where these services are most fractured, um, where these gaps are are appearing. Um, so how do we how do we bridge these gaps? Um, well, moving forward, we can see that um, there there is some progress, and uh, um, Minister Butler, I think, has outlined some of the, the 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 movements that are happening. It may seem slow, but there is a forward movement. In nineteen in twenty seventeen, the National Youth Mental Health Task Force uh, made ten, uh, which was set up by Professor Helen, uh, sorry, Minister Helen McEntee, um, who was Minister for Mental Health at the time, and uh, she the, it, it made ten recommendations. Uh, uh, with 22 actions in various uh, areas from the individual up to uh, community legislation etc now i suppose a lot of these uh, there hasn't there wasn't a huge amount of progress on these these uh, recommendations but they did inform the new mental health vision uh, policy in Ireland, which is sharing the vision. And that for the first time, unlike the previous mental health policy, a uh, vision for change actually has a focus on prevention and on youth more than the other, the other uh, did. And I'm delighted to say that the, the, um, the, the HSE and Department of Health have set up a subgroup within the Sharing the Vision implementation group called Transit the Transitions Group, which is specifically looking at transitions between uh, child and adolescent mental health services and adults. So there should be some uh, move action in that area. And as Pat mentioned very kindly, um, the, we have set up a new faculty of youth and student psychiatry in Ireland. 
which um, is a world first. And I was delighted that he, he has uh, promoted that for us. And we launched it officially at our college meeting um, just two weeks ago. So, the, so again, we'll be advocating within the College of Psychiatrists for this and, um, uh, you know, working on issues such as training and best practice and collection of data and setting up services in this area. Um, so why do we need to get this right? Well, as again, as Pat mentioned, Childhood mental illness casts a very long shadow. And it's not just in terms of, I suppose, you know, we we, we all know about the effects on, on young person mental health and their their, their, uh, their their also the physical health, but also their economic outcomes. So the economic costs related to childhood mental disorders are far more important than physical illnesses during the childhood years. Um, so it, it it leaves its mark, as you say, it leaves its long shadow. This this wonderful paper that was written back in 2011 on young people's uh, prospects all uh, through throughout life. Um, so I suppose, unfortunately, our, because of the, the, the lack of resources, and uh, we, we have very much in uh, mental health services focused on tertiary prevention, which is trying to rescue people who, um, not rescue, but to treat as well as possible people that we can, who have developed a mental disorder. Um, so we provide, you know, evidence-based care, uh, inpatient care if needed, outpatient care. Um, but there's 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 now a movement, and Pat alluded to this, to uh, move to the area of uh, secondary prevention, which is early intervention. So you're you're trying to treat people uh, just just as they're developing a, a, a mental illness and give them the best possible care really really early. And some uh, services have been set up around the country, some pilot services and early intervention psychosis, um, which are a, a kind of a model for for this, and hopefully they'll be rolled out through the country. However, what we haven't done very well in um, adult psychiatry or, or, or even child psychiatry, essentially, uh, mental health in general, is primary prevention, which is where you try to prevent the, the, the mental health problems happening in the first place. And in order to do that, you need to know more about the risk factors and protective factors for mental health problems in, in young people. So... Um, and this, and, and you find the balance between risk factors and for uh, and protective factors. And I'll talk about some of these in a sort of a whistle top tour, uh, tour because I only have have a few minutes left. So basically, um, we know that ad adversity um, is a big risk factor for childhood adversity is a big risk factor for mental health problems later in life. Now, but what what some work from our group and, and Ian Kelleher. Um, did um, on uh, looking at the effects of adversity on psychotic experiences in, in young people. These are experiences such as hallucinations or um, uh, unusual thoughts and beliefs, which don't quite meet clinical criteria. And these young people don't have a psychotic disorder, but they have these experiences. And we have shown that they are associated with increased risk for mental illness concurrently and both in the future. So they're a vulnerability factor. Um, so what Ian showed that over the course of a year in this study that was carried out in Cork and Kerry, if uh, young people who uh, were subjected to bullying and they, they are in the, the red group um, had higher incidence of, um, of psychotic experiences at baseline compared to the blue group who, who didn't have uh, experience of bullying or assaults. However, over the course of the year, if the bullying or assault stopped, you could see the dotted line here, the, the level of psychotic experiences reported fell down to those um, who had not experienced in the first place. So this is, is very heartening and optimistic news so that if you can intervene in an ongoing trauma or ongoing adversity, you can actually change someone's trajectory. In, I just talked now about some work from the Growing Up in Ireland study, which is a, a, a wonderful a cohort study. It's, it's our only child cohort study in Ireland funded by the government. And the data we looked at was between uh, young people who um, were seen at nine years and followed up at 13 years, about 8,000 young people. And there's a wealth of data on these young people. And what we looked at was factors that actually influence the response to adversity. So sometimes you can't stop the adversity happening, but you could influence the response to it and the outcomes. So what we looked at was mediating factors. And these are factors that influence the risk of uh, mental health problems or psychopathology at age 13. And what we found that parent-child conflict um, was a significant mediator in terms of, of uh, worsening the outcomes. Positive parent-child relationship had uh, in, it reduced the, the uh, negative outcomes and a child's self-concept also influenced the risk of uh, out outcomes so that um, the, the higher the self-concept, the lower the risk of um, persistent or age 13 psychopathology. 
And uh, Colm Healy from my group um, uh, has done a lovely study looking at, again, if we can change a child's self, self-esteem or self-concept over the course of this period of nine to 13, can you change the outcomes? And we, we when went back and looked at psychotic experiences again and columns show that if a child went from low self-esteem to high self-esteem in adolescence um, then his risk you can see this uh, this odds ratio of 0.22 that's so that that means it's it reduced the risk of psychotic experiences at age 13 and that was a significant factor um, however if you look at the bottom here if a child had high self-concept uh, at, at age nine and for whatever reason fell to low at age 13 you can see there's a five-fold increased almost a six-fold increased risk of exper- of reporting these psychotic experiences um, so with this is both a, a protective and a risk factor um, so uh, uh, another study, uh, Isabel Cotter, showed that um, changes in, in body mass index can also be linked with changes in psychopathology. Um, so that young people who, who um, were overweight and uh, uh, then became in, in the normal range at age 13 had a, um, a, lower, uh, a lower risk of um, psychopathology and um, for those, sorry, here you go, lower risk, 0.47. And if, if the opposite happened, if they increased overweight at age 13, they had an increased risk, with 66% increased risk of psychopathology at age um, uh, 13. Uh, and this applied both to males and, and females, particularly females. Okay, I'll skip that. Now, just to finish up, uh, something really important I think we need to talk about as well is is, is uh, cannabis um, as a as a, a potentially modifiable risk factor for for mental illness in young people. Um, uh, work in my group, Emma Power has studied, uh, did a systematic review showing that young people who use cannabis throughout uh, adolescence are at approximate uh, at risk of IQ decline of about two two points. Now we may say that's not too that's not too much. I, I you know I'll take my chances with that, but that's that's about the same level as we talk about for uh, childhood lead exposure, and we get very excited about this and banned paints with lead in them in case children would lick them, etc. Um, and um, in terms of psychosis, there's been a very influential study of, of onset of psychosis across Europe, showing showing much higher rates in three urban centres: Paris, Amsterdam, and London. And work by Robin Murray and his um, his part uh, and Marta Forty have shown that this can be linked to uh, use of high, high use of. Uh, ca- of cannabis in that uh, in those areas, and it's not both frequency of cannabis use and the THC content of cannabis use, so that you can have an increase for people, say in Amsterdam, who are frequent users, daily users of high THC cannabis. Their risk of, of developing a psychotic disorder was ninefold higher than those who uh, had not used. Um, and again, they show that approximately fifty percent of psychosis could have been prevented by if nobody used high, uh, free, uh, high THC cannabis uh, frequently. Okay, um, so I think you know we we need to be thinking about cannabis. Uh, if for mental health professionals, we need to be thinking about this in terms of a, a, a modifiable risk factor in the way that um, you know respiratory physicians and cardiologists think about tobacco, and the way that uh, gastroenterologists and hepatologists think of of, of alcohol. So we need to take it uh, that seriously. Um, so again, as I mentioned, finding the balance between risk factors and protective factors is really important. We can't just focus on one. And, uh, you know, some of these, we've put some of these thoughts into editorials uh, with Colm Healy and David Cotter and others, if you want to do more reading about that. It's a fascinating topic. Um, and uh, I hope I've just given you a little whistle stop tour through some of the things we possibly could be thinking about in terms of prevention. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Cannon. That was really interesting. And you went through it at great pace so I really appreciate that you guys <laughs> because as a mature panelist and people will have noticed we're running a little bit over so thank yeah. you for that no you'll problem. be back with us at the end yeah. for the panel discussion if people have questions so for now thank you very much Bye. we're going to move on now to the second speaker in this research session we're very happy to be joined by Ruth O'Connell who's the mental health technical expert with UNICEF for the East Asia and Pacific region good morning Ruth Yeah, we just see if Ruth is having a problem there, maybe with her mic and video. Hello, Ruth. Excuse oh, me. I think I'm she's so here. Sorry. No, I am. Excuse me. You're I fine. Having a bit of a technical moment there. That's okay. okay. We've all had them. <laughs> Don't worry about it. 
Thank you very much, Ruth. I hope you can see my screen now. Can you please let me know? Yes, you're in all your glory. We can see it. Thank you very much. Well, that's great. Um, listen, thank you very much for having me here. I'm absolutely delighted to be attending this conference and not intimidated at all by following Professor McGarry and Professor Cannon. Um, yes, so my name is Ruth O'Connell and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our approach to um, promotion and prevention in terms of adolescent mental health. Um, so um, I'm sure you're all aware of these, but these statistics are coming from our report, the State of the World's Children, pardon me, Children's Report, which was done in 2021, where we found that one in four children are living with a parent who has a mental health condition and that more than one in seven adolescents aged 10 to 19 is living with a diagnosable mental health disorder globally. We also found that half of all mental health conditions start by 14 years of age and three quarters by age 25. And most cases, while treatable, go undetected and untreated. And this is global evidence that we found in 2021, as I said, and it's, it's quite stark. We found that every 11 minutes, a child between the ages of 10 and 19 takes his or her own life somewhere in the world. Ruth, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but when you asked me about your screen, I thought you meant your video, but we're not actually seeing your slides if you have slides. I'm very sorry oh. to interrupt you now, but just as you were referring to findings, Excuse I thought, hmm, I okay. think she maybe have mentioned slides and I, I wasn't yeah. seeing them, apologies. I'm very sorry, let me go no, back. No, you're fine, see. you're fine. How I can do this, I'm so sorry. Don't worry, it's okay. Um, it's not letting me show my slides. I really sincerely apologize for this. Don't worry, because I think we have a copy of your slides, so maybe uh, we can share them for you and, and you can just say next slide when you want us, want us to move forward, maybe. Um, yes, actually, but I've, I've, I've clicked the share screen and it doesn't appear to be working. I'm so okay, sorry. Well, don't worry, about don't about, it's fine. These things happen. Don't worry at all. I'm pretty sure we have your slides. Just give us one second here to get them back up. I'm dining in from Bangkok and there was a message saying that my internet was a bit dodgy. So I sincerely apologize if that was Don't worry. I mean, what I will say is you- Your slides are up now. Most, for most exotic location and your slides are up now. So if you want us to skip forward one or two, can you remember which slide you were on? I was on the cost of human potential lost, but- um, Fantastic. No, that's I, fine. I sincerely apologize for this, everybody. Don't worry about it. Honestly, Ruth, it's absolutely fine. These things happen. And indeed, worse things have happened in previous <laughs> Zoom conferences. So it's fine. OK, so we're on cost of human potential loss, $387.2 billion a year. And we let you pick up from there. And if you want to move on, just say next slide and we'll move it forward. Thanks, okay, Ruth. Thank you very much. Um, no worries at all. Yes. So um, what we've identified as part of the State of the World Children's Report was the cost of mental disorders based on a country specific and GDP per capita. So we know that it covers issues like bipolar and eating disorder and schizophrenia. And I know the language for community based mental health workers, such as me and people who work for UNICEF, is not particularly helpful, but um, I think in terms of advocacy and policy and system strengthening, it's important to know what we're having. Um, next slide, please. So we know that in spite of all of this, there's only 2%, really, the average proportion of government health budgets are allocated to mental health. And I suppose coming from the perspective of UNICEF, working all over the world, this is what we're really trying to change. We're trying to increase the support and increase the budget allocation to support mental health before it becomes a problem. Next slide, please. So MHPSS stands for Mental Health and Psychosocial Support. And that's what UNICEF calls its mental health programming. And in, 2000, in 2021, this extended to over 130 countries. So UNICEF doesn't implement programming directly itself, but it works through national partners, community-based organizations, young people themselves, and government organizations in order to strengthen systems, address policy, and really advocate for young people's voices to be heard in how they are responded to and how they're um, treated, I suppose, in terms of their mental health. Next slide, please. 
So the State of the World's Children report that I referred to earlier was the first report that UNICEF did, and that was in 2021, that it did in terms of mental health. So it identifies emerging issues for child mental health, including stigma, which was significant, and how we need to strengthen resilience, the impacts of COVID and broader disease outbreaks, and the social determinants of mental health, the systemic challenges and drivers of poor mental health among adolescents, children, and caregivers. And it's a reference and record of latest high quality analysis and data on mental health of young people. It looks really at risk and protective factors, which Professor Cannon alluded to earlier. So I was delighted to see that. And it looks at the voices of people with lived experience relative to the risk and protective factors that they face. It's a foundation for policy outreach and advocacy, and it informs legislation that protects mental health of children. But it also really speaks to financing decisions for a severely underfunded area of work, which I think we all know about. And the main thing I suppose that the State of the World Children's Support does is that it supports convening of stakeholders, including governments, researchers, and civil society, to really support a collective approach to addressing the global burden of mental health. Next slide, please. And what, what we found from this report is that the context of adolescents' lives drive many of their mental health concerns. And this really requires addressing the context that contribute to the stress that they experience, whether that be short-term mental health difficulty, which impacts on their coping, their friendships, their school attendance, their activities, or whether it contributes to a longer-term mental health issue that they face. And the big issue that came up for us in this study was school. And despite school's many benefits, adolescents talked about the risks, including the pressure to achieve academically. And as Professor Cannon said, also to achieve both academically and in their sports, in their after-school activities and unsupportive and abusive teachers. Now, I think abusive teachers, we need to really um, contextualize in terms of this report was carried out globally, so we were looking at schools that were still using um, physical punishment, for example. And beyond general distress, the emotional and behavioral challenges that adolescents described included depression, anxiety, suicide ideation, self-harm, substance use, violence, aggression, and disordered eating. And again, to come back to it, the big issue of stigma, which significantly deters adolescents from seeking help for mental health conditions. And that really results, as I think you all know more than me, many adolescents cope without support, resulting in the use of maladaptive strategies. So the next slide, please. So the, the way UNICEF has interpreted this report and wants to move forward is that we're really looking at mental health as a positive. It's not the absence of mental ill health. It's about good mental health. And we are moving away from medicalized ill or not ill view of mental health, acknowledging the role that specialized mental health support providers can play. But we're looking at, I suppose, one step back and that we're looking at mental health as a continuum. And that throughout a child's life, a child's experience of mental health can be viewed along a, along a continuum from the perinatal period right up to adolescence and into adulthood. And this presents us with critical moments in the life course, including perinatal, early childhood and adolescence. And it reaffirms that context is key. So there are risk and protective factors in the family, in the community and the broader environment, including policy that surround the child. Next slide, please. But I suppose the good news is, well, I mean, we shouldn't be singing about it, but that we have an idea of what works. And we're looking at a multi-sectoral approach, which engages sectors. And when I say sector, I mean other service providers that an adolescent may come in contact with. So that would include health, child welfare, child protection, education. And it's not mentioned here, but I think it's particularly important to reference the children who come in conflict with the law or the judicial system. This is a key point where we can access adolescents who are experiencing mental health difficulties. And we look at the life course approach from pre-birth to adulthood in a social, social ecological model with the enabling environment around the child. So we look at 
as you can see from the, the little diagram here and all the blues, we're looking at the child with the cognitive development, the physical development and the social, spiritual and emotional development. And then the next person that impacts on that child is the family and caregiver. And then we have the community and then we have the enabling environment. So UNICEF's multi-sectoral approach looks at supporting the mental health of all of these circles to ultimately support the child and the adolescent. So the next slide, please. So we have developed a lot of resources to really support the programs, UNICEF country offices that work in humanitarian contexts, they work in development contexts, they work in contexts of natural disaster, and they work in contexts of low, middle income and high income contexts. And if anybody wants any of these um, resources, please don't hesitate to let me know. But we're really focusing now on mental health on the basis of this um, State of the World Children's Report, which really put mental health and psychosocial well-being at the centre of UNICEF's work, which it hadn't been before. Next slide, please. So, for example, we have the multi-sectoral operational framework, which is really promoting a system-wide change for mental health and psychosocial support service delivery. So we're not siloing um, mental health and psychosocial support anymore. So we're not sending a child off because they're not doing well or they're experiencing distress, nor are we identifying all children who've experienced a distressing event as being traumatized or in need of support. We're now looking at the individual and their environment. Next slide, please. So the global multi-sectoral framework, it gives us tools to develop programs and strategies that really contribute to improved mental health. It's child and adolescent focused, and it's based on the social ecological model that I talked about before. But it also addresses gaps in policy legis legislation in financing, but in a contextualized way, because we know that not all countries are the same and that countries approach this in a different way. And it's intended for use, as I said earlier, across different settings. But it does recommend actions and strategies for increasing access to quality, integrated mental health and psychosocial services, which are provided through social service, protection, health and education sectors for children. It is operational with a blending of theoretical and practical guidance. So it's, we're really trying to be evidence informed rather than, well, evidence based and at best evidence informed. Next slide, please. So what we're looking at is an approach which focuses on promotion, prevention, and response. So we really promote well being and um, based on, I suppose, looking at the determinants of ill mental health as early as we possibly can, and the protective and the risk factors. We're looking at preventing poor mental health by addressing the risks and enhancing protective factors. And then we're trying to ensure quality and accessible care for those with mental health conditions. And for UNICEF, for example, because we work mainly on a community-based structure, we would establish referral systems and work closely with, for example, WHO, or um, mental health organizations in the countries where we work. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to talk to you quickly about a conceptual framework that we've developed in East Asia and Pacific region, where we're really allocating roles and responsibilities to different sectors that a child or adolescent might come into contact with. And trying to, I suppose, make them step up to the plate and acknowledge the responsibilities they have in ensuring a psychosocially supportive environment for a child, whether it be in school, the judicial system, hospitals, or anything like that. And starting from ensuring an enabling environment, going up to prevention, and right up to subclinical and clinical care. Next slide, please. So this is just an example where we're looking at actions for the health sector, the social welfare sector, the education sector, of different roles that they can play and different emphasis on different roles. And I won't talk too much more about this because I don't have much more time, but if anybody would like to know more about this, please don't hesitate to let me know. The next slide, please. So I just wanted to give you an example, I suppose, of what UNICEF really means. What does a multi-sectoral life 
workforce approach to mental health that safeguards a continuum of care look like. So, for example, we work a lot with adolescents who are pregnant. So, for example, we would try and recognize the fact that adolescents, they might not access mental health support, but we would try and encourage them at different points of contact. So, for example, when they're seeking routine health care during pregnancy, we would look at other supports to reduce stigmatization because we know that nobody and no adolescent certainly wants to be identified as suffering from mental health difficulties. But if you're going along to get a check for your pregnancy, it's fine because nobody knows why you're there. It requires capacity building of health and social service workforce, including community-based staff and non-medical staff, knowing that we can resort to and absolutely um, refer to the medicalized support if necessary. But we're trying not to medicalize, I suppose, the normal reactions that an adolescent may feel to being pregnant, unsupported, or feeling isolated or alone. But if the adolescent needs more support, the referral systems should be in place. That's what we're aiming for. And what we believe is that a health system, for example, which supports well-being, agency, participation, and addresses mental health will have a positive impact on health promotion, adherence to health-seeking practices and behaviors, and will ultimately improve the health of the mother and the baby, including attachment, bonding, nutrition. And I have a lot of examples of where this worked but again I think we're time bound so we won't talk about it now. Next slide please. Again for this to really work effectively according to UNICEF the, the system will be point of contact for this adolescent young woman will be facilitated by a health worker, a community and youth worker trained in the identification of mental health vulnerability or signs of distress and will be provided by people tr trained in psychological first aid, which is a, um, a tool that we use. It's not a mental health response tool, but it's a tool that anybody can use. And we encourage all of our staff to be trained in it. Also staff in self-care and referral. It could be mobile, it could be static. It could be housed in a nutrition center, a community-based vocational training center, or an adolescent friendly space, which is a model that is used often in contexts of conflict, where safe spaces are set up, particularly for people on the move or who've left their homes. And this means that it's not stigmatizing because, again, you're attending the center, but you're not attending because you're experiencing mental health difficulties. And the system would also create strategies for the voice of the adolescent to be sought and to be heard so that they are active agents in the support they receive. They understand the treatment they're getting. They understand the treatment they're receiving. And if they are receiving psychiatric support, they are still able to access the community-based supports such as groups and such as perhaps life skills and basic needs support that they might need. Next slide, please. So integrating mental health services and social protection and other services and equipping workforces is what UNICEF is really trying to do in all contexts that we work in. And to do this, we're really, really looking to strengthen research and improve monitoring and supporting implementation research, and to really increase our capacity to monitor and evaluate the benefits of the mental health and psychosocial support programs that we implement. So our main message really, I suppose, is that acting early to support children and caregivers is the best investment that we can make to promote good mental health, prevent poor mental health and respond to the complex mental health issues that face our children today. And really, I suppose, to finish on the fact that the main preventable causes of poor mental health occur in childhood and adolescence, and they're not inevitable. So thank you very much. And I sincerely apologize for the difficulties I experienced in presenting. And if anybody would like any more information, please don't hesitate to contact me. And apologies again for the technical difficulties I experienced. Thank you. You really don't need to apologize, Ruth. It was absolutely fine and within the total normal gamut of things that happen in these kinds of things. So thank you so much. That was really interesting. And it was really, really interesting to see how the research bears out what we'd seen in our video during the break about yeah. the various different pressures and things that young people experience and that those 
are global, not just local to Irish teenagers that we were we were chatting yeah, to. Yeah, I, th I thought the same when I was watching during the break. So thank you. Mm, thank you very much. Yeah. And I look forward to the panel discussion. Yes, thank we'll you. be chatting to you later for that. So thanks for now, Ruth. Appreciate it. OK, we'll move on now to our next contributor this morning. We're delighted to welcome Margaret Barry, the established chair in health promotion and public health at the National University of Ireland in Galway, where she's also director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Centre for Health Promotion Research. Good morning, Margaret. Good morning, Jan, and thank you very much. Uh, really delighted to join you. I'm just bringing up my slides here, um, so hopefully we can see that. So I'm going to focus mainly on the area of mental health promotion and to look at some of the effective strategies for promoting youth mental health and well-being. So as we've already heard, I think uh, from a number of speakers, uh, promoting mental health is absolutely critical for good health and well-being, and it enables young people to grow and flourish. And that's so we really need to look at it as being important in its own right. Um, we've also seen, I think, over the last 20 years, increased recognition of the, the value and importance of promoting young people's social and emotional well-being, because this is a key asset for positive youth development and a resource for good mental health. Uh, and we also see that, you know, when young people acquire social and emotional skills, that this is really enables positive outcomes in school, work and life more generally. And of course, this is particularly important for disadvantaged and minority youth who are at increased risk of poorer social, academic and mental health outcomes. So that's really important. Uh, over 20 years ago, the World Health Organization advocated a comprehensive public health approach to mental health, looking at the fact that we need to take a population approach and that while we need to ensure access to the best available treatment, and that's really important, but that on its own, um, we need to accompany that with a focus on promotion and prevention alongside treatment and recovery. Um, and so as part of that, I'm going to focus on the mental health promotion part because we've heard about prevention. Um, and as Ruth O'Connell mentioned there, it embraces a positive concept of mental health. We look at, men at this is relevant for all people, so it's universal. Um, and we also look at, I suppose, focusing on the social determinants of mental health because these are potentially modifiable. And this requires action across sectors. So it, to look at how we can create the conditions for good mental health. So I think this does bring a kind of a paradigm shift in how we think about mental health. So we focus on good mental health, not only on mental ill health, and we look at strategies for creating the greatest mental health gain for the greatest number of young people. So it's a population approach and it focuses on the potential of young people to achieve good mental health in the context of their everyday settings for living. So it kind of helps to kind of reframe how we meet the challenge of improving youth mental health. So I think we've also seen over the last 30 years, I think more literature uh, and a better understanding of positive mental health and what that is. And we see that reflected in the definitions of mental health and that it's more than the absence of mental disorder. It's about a positive state of social and emotional well-being that really enables us to live our lives well. And we also know more about the determinants of mental health and that it's made up of a complex mix of biological, psychological, but also physical, social, cultural, economic and environmental factors. And they all interact in complex ways. And I think we probably have underestimated how some of these broader factors um, influence uh, young people's mental health. Uh, and as Professor Cannon and also Ruth O'Connell mentioned, you know, we know more about protective factors that enhance and protect good mental health and also risk factors that increase the likelihood that mental health problems will develop, be that exposure to adversity, stressful life events and protective factors having a good uh, supportive relationships, access to education, good quality housing, etc. So it's the cumulative impact of the risk and protective factors across the life course that really makes the difference. And so we say we talk in mental health promotion about mental health being created where we live our everyday lives. And I think that's a, a key focus. So the area of mental health promotion has developed as a multidisciplinary area of research and practice again over the last 30 years. And its focus is on strengthening protective factors for good mental health and enabling access to the skills, the resources 
and the supportive environments that will in keep people uh, mentally healthy and enhance equity. So that's that's important. Uh, and here in the, the little graphic there, I look at where mental health promotion sits alongside prevention, treatment and maintenance. So our treatment services are concerned with case identification and uh, appropriate treatment. We then have recovery services. But prevention comes before that to look at how we can reduce the risk of mental uh, uh, health problems and mental disorders from from starting actually if we know that there are uh, triggers for that and mental health promotion underpins all of that by looking at how do we keep uh, the general population uh, mentally healthy uh, and living well uh, there's detail in that textbook on implementing mental health promotion where we've brought together examples of mental health promotion in action from around the world with contributions uh, from many authors about really successful interventions um, uh, you know that really can make a significant difference uh, in terms of good mental health outcomes. So the model then in terms of addressing the social determinants of mental health is that we seek to work at different levels and this report from the the WHO in 2014 made an important statement in saying that mental health and many common mental disorders are shaped to a great extent by the social, economic and physical environments in which people live. So we need to strengthen individuals and families, make sure they have the skills and you know a sense of control, positive uh, self-concept. Also strengthening communities, supportive relationships and a sense of connectedness and inclusion. Reorient our health services so that we can integrate mental health promotion and prevention into our standard health services, that they're included. Uh, remove the structural barriers at a societal level, and this is a big one. And this looks at, you know, our culture, environment, economic and social policies, and the extent to which they influence mental health. So having access to a good quality education, employment, healthy environments for living, uh, being treated with a sense of respect, dignity and social justice, which, of course, people who are ex socially excluded or marginalised do not experience. So we talk about a mental health in all policies approach, because if we want to influence these other sectors will then policies in those areas can really make a significant difference. So we're looking at comprehensive and universal actions across the life course in multiple sectors and in key settings uh, where we live our everyday lives. <clears throat> so moving then, so what works? The evidence base has been grown and we now have quite a compelling evidence, I think, around feasible strategies that can be implemented, that can make a significant difference in terms of improving youth mental health and well-being. The, in mental health promotion, the, the focus is on a life course approach where we have policies and interventions from infancy to old age, a settings approach. So we look at in the home, the school, community, workplace, in our services and indeed in our virtual settings and a determinants of mental health approach, because this is critical in terms of reducing inequities. So we have been engaged with doing a series of evidence synthesis from high, middle and low income countries for various government agencies for WHO, etc. And I've just put some some of them up here, but I'm not going to trouble you with the detail. The references are there if you want to look at them. But actually, we have evidence that when you promote mental health and well-being, that you enhance, you can enhance the protective factors for good mental health, reduce the risk factors for mental disorders. But also there are co-benefits in terms of leading to better outcomes in academia, you know, in schools, in employment, social functioning and health. So there's a convincing scientific, social and economic case as well as the moral argument for investing in the promotion of youth mental health and well-being. As Martin Knapp and his colleagues from the HSE has shown, there's a good social return on investing in this. So just quickly then to look at some examples. So looking at schools, because I, I could see there during the break, a lot of young people highlighted the pressure of schools. So promoting social and emotional well-being through a whole school approach really is is very important in terms of ensuring that young people have access to what we call universal social and emotional learnings, all young people, as well as targeted prevention programmes. The evidence is now very strong in support of this, teaching social and emotional skills in a coordinated and sequenced way within the educational system. Um, and the outcomes, now very robust evidence here, outcomes show that not only does it improve uh, social and emotional skills, but it also improves their academic engagement and performance. Young people do 
better in school, they've um, improved social behaviours, reduced conduct problems and reduced emotional distress. Um, so that's from the universal programmes. We also know that the targeted interventions are quite effective in reducing depression, anxiety and suicidal behaviours. So, and again, the economic return here is as high as 25 to 1. So for every dollar invested, there's a $25 return because of the benefits to education and employment. There are many examples of really effective programs that are in operation. Uh, we have Friends program is being implemented here in Ireland. We've got the Kiva anti-bullying program. And we look at tiered delivery within a whole school approach so that there is support for every child, more support for some, and then for, for the small number who need specialist support that that is available. So this needs to be embedded in educational policy. We're not talking about once-off programs. Supports and training for teachers, because if you want to see the academic benefits teachers need to deliver this and that you're providing foundational skills for a range of other positive outcomes. We've been working uh, on the Mind Art programme developed with the HSE and my colleague Catherine Dowling has done uh, a large scale RCT on this, looking at the um, uh, positive outcomes for adolescents, particularly in disadvantaged schools, uh, improve social and emotional well-being and improve, you know, reduce depression and stress and reduced anxiety for young female students. But you only get those positive outcomes where there's high quality implementation. And and that's key. We need to focus more on the implementation piece as well, <clears throat> you know, how it's going to be implemented effectively. In community settings, we can also look at how social and emotional skills can be learned through other methods. So for children who dropped out of school, who are not in employment or a disadvantage. So learning this through creative arts, participation in drama, music, outdoor adventure, mentoring programs to provide the good one, the one good adult who may not be in their in, in their in their lives, social action projects. And these are particularly for at risk young people. So we have evidence. Again, it's not as strong as in schools, but it's quite promising in terms of positive outcomes, particularly from more structured approaches with high quality implementation. Big Brothers, Big Sisters program in operation here in Ireland, communities that care, there's examples, and again, uh, social action programs. Just touching digital interventions, because there's a lot of discussion around social media, but I think we can also harness some of the benefits of social media for promoting young people's mental health and well-being, and, and it is a virtual setting. But there's very strong evidence for the impact of computerised uh, CBT prevention programmes, anxiety and depression. In relation to mental health promotion, the evidence isn't as strong, but it's emerging, and we see an increasing focus on mental health literacy for young people, and also using digital interventions to support the development of life skills and competencies. And that's, you know, gaming, uh, structured online modules, blogging. Uh, again, my colleague, Dr. Tuli Kuzman, did a, 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 an RCT here of a gaming intervention from New Zealand. And again, it was for disadvantaged young people. What we found there is that there's a high dropout rate on this, and particularly from those at higher risk. So we really need to look at how they're implemented, how we can provide support and guidance for young people, you know, to stay the course with this, ensuring that the equity impact is there, that these interventions have a positive focus, that they can be tailored to the needs of individuals individual young people and that the young people themselves are engaged and are participating in terms of what, what their needs are and shaping the development of these because there's a lot of apps out there that have absolutely no evidence behind them and there's a lot of very good evidence programs that are not being brought to scale. So we have a lot of evidence um, and we have evidence that supports universal delivery of interventions for all young people, be that within schools or community, and also for more targeted approaches that are proportionate to need. And so we need to cater for the mental health needs of all young people. Um, and so I think we, uh, we have uh, quite a bit of evidence and we need to close the science to practice gap. So I would say we need to implement what we know works. And that we also need that back that up with supportive policies and practices, how we can embed what we know works into mainstream delivery. So scale it up, uh, have effective implementation. And that's especially important in low resource settings, maximizing, maximizing young people's participation and the reach and impact of what can be delivered. The equity impact of interventions is very important because young people are not homogenous. There are different needs for different uh, groups of young people 
people depending on sexual orientation, ethnicity, young travelers, refugees, etc. So we need to be mindful of that and engage those young people in, in the development and delivery. And so I will finish by saying that we need to see investment in mainstreaming mental health promotion policies and practices that can create supportive environments for young people that will empower young people and enhance their skill development and enable them to grow and flourish. So I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. That was brilliant. That was really interesting. And uh, I've no doubt we'll have some questions in the chat for you by the time we get to our panel discussion in, in a short while. We're on to our final contributor now in this research session of, of today's proceedings. Um, I'd like to welcome Fiona McNicholas, who's consultant in child and adolescent psychiatry. Good morning, Fiona. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Can you see my screen OK? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. Lovely. Uh, the host has asked you to start your video. OK, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, up until now, the primary focus has been on primary uh, promotion and mental health prevention. And Ruth spoke about the dimension along the mental health spectrum. And I'm going to jump to the other end of that dimension and talk about mental illness and talk about the specialist services, CAMS, that provide that. And what I'd like to do is to highlight how COVID-19 has become somewhat of a syndemic and has exposed much of the social determinants of ill health that uh, were spoken about earlier and how we are in somewhat of a crisis. So um, from the beginning, OK. Um, it's almost three years now that we're living with COVID. The response in the beginning, if you remember it, was one of sheer panic, many, many restrictions and lockdowns. And that was very much based on fear of the unknown, high mortality rate. And at that time, Ireland had one of the fewest ICU beds per population. And so there was a real concern that hospitals would absolutely be overwhelmed. So we have managed through a number of different variants and we've managed through a number of different waves. Restrictions have been lifted and reapplied and indeed our health service survived. And not only that, but some people feel that Ireland did rather well compared to other countries, notwithstanding that any death due to COVID uh, had a huge impact on uh, individual families. Um, However, in the medium term and with the vaccination rollout program being so successful, uh, from a physical perspective, we did very well. And so early on in the discourse, uh, it shifted from physical illness to a focus on mental health. And it was likened to the greatest threat uh, to mental health since the Second World War. And early on, uh, members from the College of Psychiatry also recognized the huge threat to the mental health services. So that's those individuals who would go along the dimension of mental health right to mental illness and where they would need some specialized intervention. There is a bi-directional relationship between COVID and mental illness in that patients who already had a psychiatric illness were much more likely to become infected with COVID. And that remained even after you controlled for other risk factors. Uh, similarly, uh, patients who developed COVID had a higher rate of developing either new or uh, deteriorating mental illness in the three, six, nine months following COVID infection. And we're beginning now to see that there's a long-term COVID, which also involves neuropsychiatric and psychiatric illness. In terms of how that uh, risk is present from patients with psychiatric illness, we recognize that in general, they are poorer, uh, have poorer physical illness. They may be on medication, which may affect or have affected the immune system. And also there's that element of difficulty in staying safe, keeping themselves safe and adhering to the uh, restriction and the guidelines. In terms of the direct impact of the virus on mental illness, one might have been its neurotoxicity, having a direct effect on the brain. But apart from that, uh, the impact of getting the illness yourself and being forced to isolate either in hospital and the medical treatments, being separated from your family or isolating at home, not being able to work and additional economic adverse effects that might have had. 
Um, even though we knew that children early on were much less likely to develop the illness, and when they did, the morbidity was much lower, the restrictions applied to everybody. Uh, and there weren't any stratified or specific um, individualized restrictions. And I think we are becoming increasingly aware now of the detrimental effect this had on youth. And I would imagine that other pandemics will not apply blanket restrictions in the same way as they did initially. So for over the two million youth of Ireland, you can imagine not going to school, having universities and schools closed, uh, removing them from the very important socialization that they were involved in, reducing uh, sports, uh, either individual exercise or group led activities. And being at home, oftentimes having to do your study at home, your lessons at home. And again, we know there's huge disparities in the availability of internet, a safe space to do it, a quiet space to do it, or even having a computer. But also add to that the fact that parents are now working from home. And so there may be a huge amount of increased expressed emotion, and particularly in those families where there was uh, abuse and distress, uh, they were adversely and the worst affected. Immediately following COVID, we knew from the, uh, this is going back into the middle of the mental health dimension, those who experienced significant distress, that there was an initial increase in uh, seeking um, the support, whether it was um, spun out or um, jigsaw. And we must remember that some of that is normal and a positive reaction to stress. It's good to respond uh, and protect ourselves during uh, acute stresses. But what's important is that we're able to manage that and that it doesn't become chronic. Um, in studies that were done in the United Kingdom as well, also showed that over the period of time, that the rates of mental illness from the point of view of diagnosable mental illness amongst the community increased from probable one in nine to a probable one in six over that period of time. And just like Pat McGarry was saying, the risk groups were adolescents and female risk groups, but also those where the lockdown had made their lives worse and where there was a lot of family difficulties, family arguments, parental mental illness or difficulties economically. Looking at our own data in Ireland and looking at whether the stress that was there um, as a result of COVID and the mental health difficulties, whether they actually led to an increase in hospitalised presentations. So the first study, uh, which is an international study, which was done with eight different uh, emergency departments around the world, Ireland being one of them, and this subsequently was extended to 22 studies. Initially, there was an overall reduction in attendances at hospitals, but what you noticed was the proportion of those children attending for self-harm increased uh, significantly. And they were more common, ironically, uh, among men, which we don't typically see. And they were also more common among children who were looked after or in care. Looking at our own data in Ireland amongst five paediatric emergency departments, what we saw initially was that overall for the whole year of COVID, that emergency attendances uh, dropped significantly compared to the previous year. But apart from the initial two months of COVID where the mental health presentations decreased, they didn't decrease to the same extent as they did with the physical presentations. And unlike the physical presentations, which continued to remain lower throughout the rest of the year, rates for psychiatric presentations to the emergency departments actually increased over that period of time. Fiona, it's Paul Fear here. Could I intervene just for two seconds? I wonder, could you go on to slide view? I think you're on, um, uh, it's bottom sort of right of, the, uh, of your screen. There should be a little uh, icon with a, a screen on it. If you click, on, that's better. Is that okay from your point of view? Thank you, Paul, and apologies right. for that. No, no Thank you. Um, so now moving on to the hospital presentations and using the height data. And again, there's that initial delayed effect, which was present everywhere. The first two months, I think everybody was in shock, staying at home, heeding the orders not to uh, go out unless it was essential. But over a period of time in the second half of COVID, we saw proportionally more children being admitted as well as attending the emergency department. There were more children being admitted to the hospital for uh, psychiatric reasons. Looking at attendances at the child psychiatry outpatient services, and this uh, reflects 13% of all the children living in Ireland, the Lucina catchment area uh, among seven different CAMs. 
And again, the first uh, period saw a reduction, but between September right up until December, there was a significant increase in children presenting to CAMS clinics. What they were being presented with, and this is a study done with Lucina Tala Clinic, we looked at GP referrals pre and post COVID in terms of the main reason for referral. And what you saw that those children where there was an indication of self-harm or suicidal ideation increased statistically during that period. And what hasn't been reported so far in the literature is that there was a reduction in children attending with either autistic spectrum disorder or ADHD. And that's understandable by way of fact that many of the schools had changed to online learning. And so the teacher would normally be the first person to recognize ADHD and suggest a referral was no longer doing that. And I think that is something we need to bear in mind in subsequent pandemics uh, if school closures are to be part of the uh, response. Uh, as before, there was a trend towards female, the older age and urgent referrals. What we've noted in Ireland and has been noted internationally and has been referred to as the tsunami of eating disorders is that there has been an increase in eating disorder presentations among adolescents. And again, in the Lucina Clinic, we found that not only did we see an increased monthly referral, but we actually saw children being referred with a faster degree of weight loss and with a shorter duration of illness. Um, so um, this has been, as I say, also noted in the eating disorder admissions, both in adolescents and in adult uh, services, where there has been an increased number for eating disorders. And this trend has continued speaking to our admissions in Crumlin Hospital over the last few years. And indeed in Temple Street, we've seen a continued increase in presentations for atypical and typical eating disorders. Um, not everything about COVID has been negative and there has been significant positives. There have been positive health promotional changes by way of exercise and eating attitudes uh, and, and indeed family time spent together where parents had more time to work from home and had prioritized time with their children. Um, what we also know from some studies, one large study uh, in Canada with over a thousand children, they found that a third of the young children and a fifth of the adolescents actually showed an improvement in mental health well-being during COVID. And I guess the difficulty there is predicting who's having a beneficial effect, but more than likely those who are having an adverse effect are those who are already experiencing mental health difficulties and indeed attending CAMS or on the waiting list. Uh, other benefits of the pandemics um, has been traumatic growth and resilience in some, and an awareness and a discussion about the inequalities of the social determinants of health, the rapid adoption and the efficacious use of telepsychiatry, the value of e-health records and data gathering, and the public discourse about mental health and the importance of mental health is to be welcome and hopefully will be met with uh, additional funding. And uh, just like Ruth was talking about the recognition of a need for investment in public health and physical and mental health, and the imperative to focus on adolescent mental health. And so we welcome UNICEF 2021, the first focus on youth mental health. But moving back to the services that delivered the specialist mental illness, we know before COVID that um, referrals to CAMS were increasing year on year. And we also were aware that there was very high levels of burnout amongst consultants and indeed multi-professional staff working within CAMS. And this was also true for adult mental health services. 72.3% experienced high levels of personal burnout and a higher number of work burnout. But there was also low confidence in government commitment to CAMS and low confidence in the HSE ability to plan and manage CAMS and the high turnover intention of those who indicated they had seriously considered changing jobs in the prior six months stood at almost 70%. And that's a huge concern for our workforce. We also know that there's a low level of staffing on the vision uh, based on a vision for change. Um, and during COVID, we've also been aware that there have been additional stressors. The Maskey report uh, unearthed some of those and the adverse effect that has had on uh, CAMs and services around the country has been quite significant. So the long-standing underinvestment in CAMs is something that we must not lose sight on. 
And although I wholeheartedly support the focus of previous speakers in this section to date around mental health promotion and primary intervention, it must happen in parallel with, but there's a very urgent need for investment of CAMS. Uh, we always get the smallest slice of the pie, and although 23 million had been allocated to commence the implementation of sharing the vision, in reviewing the implementation plan for the first uh, quarter, of the 100 recommendations that are there, very, very little uh, specific detail is on CAMS. The youth mental health and the transition to, youth, to adult services is welcome, but really we need to make sure that the generic services and the out of our services and the emergency service are actually properly planned for. So what can we do as individual members of the public? What can we do in our professional roles as psychiatrists and clinicians working within the space as College of Psychiatry members? Uh, we, we have to continue to advocate both for services for each end of the mental health dimension. And one of my biggest worries is, are we too burnt out? Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor McNicholas. That was really interesting. Thanks a lot uh, for that. And now we'll get straight into our panel discussion because we're running fairly over time. And actually on that, we're going to reduce, we had made an allocation for a longer break. We're going to reduce it to just five minutes because realistically we, um, with, the, with the fact that it's a virtual conference, you still can move around and get tea or coffee or whatever if you need as, as some of the, the later presentations are going on. So I hope that's okay. We're going to reduce the break to five minutes. But as everybody gets their um, videos turned back on for the panel discussion, uh, I think what we'll kick off with, there's been a lot of great questions in the chat and all of our contributors have been really great at getting back to people directly, which means a number of the questions we won't actually address in the discussion, but you can find if you've noticed it during the, the chat, you can find answers in the chat and the Q&A function there, which is, which is good. So I think maybe what we'll begin with is, I'm just thinking, Ruth, if you could maybe share with us the impact of working in communities that have like a complex range of additional challenges. Like it was interesting, we were talking about how the research kind of bore out that a lot of young people feel a lot of the same pressures, but of course there's a lot of different challenges in working in those communities. Could you maybe give us a bit of context around that? Yeah, thank you. Oh, we just can't hear you there, Ruth. Have you got your, you just need to unmute. Yeah, there you go, perfect. This is just, wonderful isn't it how well I've dealt with the technology today <laughs> please you're fine <laughs> it speaks to my professionalism I think but um no I think that's um I, I really welcome the opportunity to talk about this because I was aware that I was speaking to um an Irish community and I think um and a European environment and I think many of the responses that we have come up with in UNICEF has come from a real misunderstanding of mental health which is combined with perhaps like witchcraft or um, engagement in armed groups. So um, maybe I wasn't clear enough in my presentation that we really are speaking to contextualization. So the, the strategies that we're developing, we are contextualizing for Europe, for Ukraine now, for example, and um, also for places like in West Africa, in Yemen. But I do think that the strategies we speak to are very relevant as well. The multi-sectoral approach to Ireland, but I did see the comment um, from Professor McGarry, and he was dead right. We, um, but I don't want to make out that we're advocating for people to hide their mental health issues. But in some contexts, we have to, because it could result in their persecution. So I should have made that clear, I think, in my presentation. And thank you for the opportunity to do so. But obviously, we work very hard to engage um, and, and have participation of adolescents and contextualize their engagement so it's safe for them to do so but thank you very much for that opportunity Not at all. it's really it's really interesting to you know I mean even when you mention witchcraft this is the thing I mean we may know about socioeconomic challenges or patriarchal structures in community but like really there is a a, a huge range of additional challenges that we just would never encounter really here yeah 
No, so, um, but I hope my presentation was relevant all the same. And thank you very much. Oh, no, it, it was, of course. It was really, really interesting. Um, I just wanted, there's a couple of questions around age with youth and mental health services. So one, Paddy asked us a question around with the transition from youth mental health services to adult services at age 25, what do you think differentiates the group or groups who will need longer term adult services from those who can be discharged back to primary care and are there service models or strategies that can help bridge that gap for longer term patients? Anybody in particular want to take that one or will I, Professor Pat McGarry, please? <laughs> Well, well uh, th thanks, Penny. Um, that's exactly what we're grappling with right now because <clears throat> we're shifting the boundary in Victoria to 25. Um, and um, it's certainly a much easier task to work out who those people are that need longer term adult care at 25 than it is at 18. Um, so it's much easier. You know, and and uh, how, how to predict them? Well, you know, I suppose... Um, We've had a good go. We, as long as we're properly resourced, we, we've had a good go at treating them in a holistic and in, intensive way. And and whether they've responded well enough or not will be clear. And whether they have a, more, a longer term <clears throat> need, hopefully the group will be much smaller at twenty five than it would have been earlier. And mm -hmm. and that, that's obviously a research question to determine if that's the case. Mm -hmm. and it's going to be dependent on our ability to, <clears throat> to deliver evidence based care effectively to those those patients during that window. But but I, I would like to see a little bit more courage from other countries in, and even other parts of Australia in making that transition because we've made it in the primary care zone, you know, but we haven't made it in the specialist zone. And there's actually a resistance from child psychiatrists about this. You know, so they're nervous, even though their territory, <clears throat> like Fiona was saying, is very small. It's not big enough anyway, but they, they're worried about their territory being somehow infringed upon. So it's a turf issue as well. And we've got to get over that because... And there's a way of doing that so it's a win-win for child psychiatrists because this is expanding the developmental zone, if you like, right up to 25. And there are developmental challenges in that in that 18 to 25 zone, which are not being addressed by adult mental health care. And in fact, the experience of those young adults is very poor in those adult mental in those traditional adult mental health services, which focus on middle-aged patients. So to me, we we've got to come together on this. And and so Patty's question is just. It's, it's an aspect of it, but it's not the fundamental paradigm shifting question. And, and if you look at all the, all the publications from global mental health people and adolescent health people, they all talk about either 10 to 24 or 12 to 25. So no one's talking about 0 to 18, except the traditional mm -hmm. status quo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, there's an interesting sort of related question to that from Grace, which is around the idea of a young person beginning an assessment in CAMS but aging out before that assessment is complete at 18 and does the adult community mental health service complete the assessment or where does the young adult then go that this is an, an added complication I don't know Fiona if you want to to comment on that. Yeah well my initial thing Jen was to say that the milestone study is a big European study on transitions from child to adult services and our own Irish eye track study the question is like who gets to move across to adult services and what we have found is that ADHD are least likely to make the gap although they would have a very very real need mm. for it now we welcome yep. the national clinical program and hope that that will change it but typically if you're on medication and if you have you know psychotic illness you're much more likely to and and obviously you need <clears throat> to move across to adult services mm. but i think it's it it's difficult to know who definitely needs it so I think what needs to happen is that you need to have that transition between child and adult services. And as Mary was saying, that that youth model, probably, you know, in some ways, it's whether you have three different services working together. Mm -hmm. The issue of who starts the assessment, Grace, is part of that. As long as you have separate models that aren't unified, you're going to end up where one person has to continue with a new assessment. And that can't be helpful. So whether you have a concertina effect where CAMS at times are able to continue up until 2021 and adult services are able to dip down, I'm not sure how the planning of that is going to go. 
Mary, did you want to say something? Oh, uh, that yeah, it, 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 these are all really valid points and there, there's no answers yet. Um, there's a group, there's a sub a group, as I mentioned, it's called the transitions uh, subgroup of the sharing the vision implementation plan, looking at precisely these issues. So gathering information from international um, uh, you know, uh, uh, models and um, you know it's just seeing what might work in the Irish system it's not these are not simple things to sort out but you know it, it I imagine you know next year things will emerge you know as to how this is going to be looking. Okay. Um, Margaret we had a question in for you as well just around the expectation around the mental health support if there was an expectation that teachers would deliver that mental health support or more refer to special services. And if we are looking at that idea of referring to spe special services, the access to special services is a huge problem. Yeah, just in relation to what the, the programs I was talking about, these are social and emotional learning programs. And like in Ireland, these are delivered within the wellbeing framework and they're taught as part of our mandatory national curriculum on social and personal health education. So they're quite structured approaches. So teachers are trained to deliver these. It's not about mental health care as such. It's about young people acquiring these social and emotional skills. So like coping skills, communication skills, treating each other with respect respect, empathy, these kind of skills. Um, and, and this is already happening. This is already happening in, in, in our schools and is, and is supported. And, and also NEPS, then the National uh, Educational Psychological Service, obviously have a role in relation to supporting referrals. But of course, yes, the access then is the major issue, as we know, uh, in terms of for the, for, the, for the smaller proportion of young people who will need additional and specialist and specialist care. That's not the job of the teachers. That, that is for the specialist services. So it's very clear about those kind of demarcations. And just there was also comments about, about budget. I mean, when we look at mental health promotion, the budget doesn't necessarily always come from mental health. It comes from sectors like education. It comes from sectors like justice. And we actually have now a national mental health promotion strategy within our health service, Stronger Together, that was launched in 2022. And the Department of Health are currently developing a national mental health promotion plan, which will have an intersectoral approach. So these are quite positive developments uh, looking at cross-sector engagement. OK, thanks for that. Um, just before we wrap up for a break, just wondering if any of you, if there was any particular thing that jumped out at any of you across the morning that you wanted to raise in, in at, at this point in the discussion. I'll take the silence as a no. <laughs> That's your role. Just one thing worth mentioning, Brian McNulty in the in the Q&A, just on what you were saying, Mary, about just how difficult it is to to deal with this transition and how, you know, Fiona and Pat were also discussing, just Brian was saying as a service user that he found he was growing emotionally and developing emotionally a lot between the ages of 18 and 25, which no doubt is also another complicating factor, never mind just the, the logistics of dealing with um, age brackets, etc. that the for service users, it's a really transitional time too. So thanks, well, Brian, for sharing that with us. Yeah, and well, if people can keep an eye out for any any opportunities to to take part in consultations or workshops on this process, you know, um, to, 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 we need all the voices we can get uh, to try and help get this right. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mary. Uh, just to say as well, earlier when when Ruth was making her presentation, we dropped in links to the State of the World's Children Report and the UNICEF Global Multisectoral Operational Framework into the chat. So if there are documents that you'd like to do a little bit of research in or read up on, the links are, are in the chat. So look, for now, all that remains is to thank you all so much for a really interesting morning session. I think based on the level of interaction in the chat and Q&A, people got an awful lot out of it. It was really interesting. And, you know, thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. And everybody else will see you in five minutes. So that's at, uh, let's say, almost 20 past 12. Thanks, everybody.
Hi everybody, welcome back. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, we're going to just crack straight in now to our next session, which focuses on implementation. And we'll be hearing from Tiernan O'Neill, Niall Muldoon, Professor Alfgeir Chris Jansen, and Blessing Dada before a panel discussion at the end. Now, Tiernan and Alfgeir both have to leave before the panel discussion because we're running late. So if you have a question for either of them, maybe ask it during their presentation and I'll put it to them when they finish. So let's begin with Tiernan O'Neill and Tiernan is from the Moiros Education Support Programme. Good afternoon, Tiernan. Thanks for joining us. Thanks a million, Jan. I'm just sharing my screen there, sorry. Can you all see that there? Perfect. Thanks, Tiernan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be here with you all uh, this afternoon. Uh, I suppose I've had the pleasure of doing a small piece of work with Paul and some of the team in St. Pat's in recent years in partnership, actually, with the National Parents Council. And I suppose from their work, I'm well aware of their suppose, desire, really, to bring about transformative change in how mental health supports uh, and therapeutic supports are embedded within the uh, Irish education system. Um, I myself, I am the principal of Corpus Christi Primary School in Myros. Uh, one second there now, guys. I'm just moving on the slide. And yeah, Corpus Christi Primary School in Myros in Limerick City. Um, I'm currently on a secondment, a 12-month secondment with the Regeneration Director of Limerick City and County Council, where I'm working as the Social Regeneration Coordinator. I've spent almost 21 years working in Myras, and I suppose I've seen at first hand both the need for therapeutic and wellness support in schools and also how they positively impact on children and families' life outcomes. Um, the school itself is a Desh Band 1 school, um, 400 children in the school, and it's the only school based in the community of Myras. Myras at one point would have been the largest local authority housing estate in the, in the country. It would have been approximately 1,200 houses here, 7,000 people. Um, and sadly, I suppose during the mid to, to late 90s, you know, societal issues became deeply entrenched within the community and led, sadly, really to the only way you can describe it as, as an, an implosion of the community in the uh, early to mid noughties that led to a government sponsored regeneration program um, that was, I suppose, underpinned by three pillars, social regeneration, physical regeneration and economic regeneration. And I suppose the scale of the issues within the community were, were it, sadly regularly borne out through the poverty deprivation index which again unfortunately shows my ass has been one of the most disadvantaged communities in the country and in terms of the impact it's had on kids there was quite a seminal piece of research done on i suppose how are our kids really within the communities as part of the regeneration process in 2010 and it really showed the stark reality of the the, the scale of mental health issues within some of our communities in in limerick where you had you know, behavioural issues, mental health issues that were four and five times the Irish and US averages. And I suppose it it frightened us into, I suppose, a state of action, I suppose, is the only way to describe it. And in terms of the, the regeneration programme, there was a lot of work done, I suppose, in terms of, you know, the physical side of regeneration, building houses. But I think it became very apparent to us that it had to be about much more than building houses. It was about building communities. It was about building people. And that was the key part of the regeneration programme. Um, and for me, I suppose I've worked as a class teacher, I've worked as a homeschool community liaison coordinator, and I was principal up to my commencement of my secondment. And I suppose the role that the deepest impact on me was undoubtedly the role of the homeschool liaison. I suppose I was in the role in the mid noughties at a time when I suppose Ireland really was busy, I suppose, surfing the Celtic tiger away for want of a better phrase. Whilst, as I said, areas of the city were imploding and I suppose the scale of the societal ills at the time were absolutely astronomical and it frightened me, I suppose, and it angered me that, you know, in the midst of this relative prosperity, children and families were facing just huge violence and trauma. And undoubtedly, these experiences, I suppose, shaped and coloured my values and beliefs as I entered into the role of principal and I suppose copper facet my beliefs uh, that if we are serious about you know, tackling under uh, tackling educational underachievement. We needed to support the promotion of social and emotional intelligences in tandem with the development of academic intelligences. Like I've seen it for years here. You know, you cannot expect children to come in and get, come in and engage with a curriculum if they're not being properly supported, both socially 
and emotionally. And again, I suppose coming back to Einstein's theory of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We just felt, particularly over the last 12 years, as part of that regeneration process, we needed to do our business differently. We had to, because at the end of the day, it wasn't working for our children. It wasn't working for our community. So we became very, I suppose, solution focused, particularly from a social and emotional perspective. And over the past number of years, the school, in partnership with Limerick City Council and the Regeneration Programme, along with the support of philanthropists, with, along with Rethink Ireland, I suppose we've developed a, a suite of family support and therapeutic programmes, which are coordinated by Dr. Declan Ahern, a retired head of student counselling in the University of Limerick. And Declan works in the school on a, a voluntary basis. And these support pro programmes that I've you see here in the screen run both during and after school hours. And, you know, again, you can see that some of the, the programs that we're rolling out and ultimately this is about creating, I suppose, a suite of supports uh, that will ultimately lead to improve life outcomes for, for children and families. And I suppose the program also has opened my eyes to the opportunities and the potential to meaningfully embed, I suppose, community based mental health models in our schools that, again, can ultimately improve life outcomes for children and families. Uh, we call our project, as you can see on the screen, the sky is the limit project. And really, it's a whole school. I suppose, wraparound model approach, which is in essence the delivery of an integrated educational and therapeutic service delivery model on site in the school. Um, we're constantly looking to, uh, to how we can develop it, how we can evolve it. As, you, as mentioned by previous contributors, the universal programs are very, very important. For example, we run a, a, the whole school mindfulness program using the pause.b curriculum. We also run a lot of individual therapeutic support programs. For example, we've approximately 50 children a week engage in individual therapeutic programs. We also run counselling programs for parents and for the wider community. We've got 25 uh, community members who are engaged in, in weekly counselling. Uh, it's a, a vital service. It's a very well-received service. I think the school is seen as quite a safe place for people to engage in these supports, and it, and it has worked really, really well. And just in terms of some of the, the programs that we're rolling out, you can see that the mindfulness, the music therapy, obviously play therapy, and one that works, uh, I suppose, very well for us as well is the equine therapy programs. And again, I'd be a firm believer in partnership. And we run these program, the equine therapy program, in partnership with our local Garda Youth Diversion Project and, uh, and with the support of Limerick City Council. And really the program consists of weekly sessions in an equine centre with a trained therapist who works with a number of parents and children through the medium of the horse. I suppose it's provided us really with a tremendous platform to develop empathy and I suppose to support the social and emotional development of families in our school. Um, interestingly, one of the first children who engaged in the programme with his uh, mother is now a professional jockey with the horse proving to be both an incredible, I suppose, therapeutic and also educational resource to the family. Um, we see, I suppose, as well, the, the green shoots of hope in terms of the work that's developed as a result of the, these programmes. You know, last year we had 12 parents in the school who returned to further education. We see improved attendance in the school. We see improved numeracy and literacy scores. And we just see improved outcomes in general for the children in, in the school and in the wider community. And as part of that process, we've recently scaled up our, I suppose, service delivery model. And we've built a, a wellness hub through fundraising that consists of two adult counselling rooms that has three child therapy rooms, one multi-purpose activity space and a, and a care team room as well. And uh, the development of this facility, which I suppose we see really as a modern integrative service centre, drives, I think, collaboration and innovation. And we were very fortunate last year to be in receipt of a public service innovation award. I think it's great to get accolades like like that but for, for me what I really acknowledged and celebrated was the fact that this was a, a multi-stakeholder a multi-agency approach that was I suppose moving looking at how we could reimagine our service delivery model would ultimately the children and families at the core of our work and um, I suppose again as previous contributors have, have spoken about you know the scale of mental health issues within our community they're absolutely huge and I think schools can potentially provide with the necessary support I suppose, practical solution focused responses to the tsunami really of mental health difficulties children and families face in their everyday lives. Um, again, as mentioned previously, COVID-19 has further exacerbated the plight of so many families in our country. I think the need for increased mental health supports has never been greater. Um, our school has been extremely fortunate to engage with you know, partner organizations such as the City Council, Rethink Ireland, TUSLA, 
the HSE that have supported the project, as we said about creating a landscape, I think where communities be can become masters of their own destiny. And, you know, again, for me, it always comes back to the kids. And I think this, I suppose, quote from Rita Pearson really sums it up best for me that, you know, every child deserves a champion. You know, adults who will not give up on them, who understand the power of connection and insist that they become the best they can possibly be. You know, we hear so much about the United Nations Convention on the Right of Children, that you know, children need to be nurtured, they need to be protected, they need to be empowered. I think we need to do more to action that. I think that, as I said, I certainly see within our community, when we work together collectively, when we build that coalition of the willing, how we can improve life outcomes for children, we need to continue to do that. We need to continue to do our best for our children. I really hope, it's my expressed hope really, that as we work together in partnership, we can contribute to creating, a, I suppose, a transformative really post-pandemic landscape for the children in our care. The extraordinary context, I think, undoubtedly requires an extraordinary re response from us all. And it's certainly the, the least that our children deserve. Thank you. Thanks, Tiernan. Well, certainly it sounds like you and your colleagues are definitely champions for the community of Moy Ross. So fair play. That sounds like a really great, impactful programme. And I'm just, I, you know, I'm conscious that you won't be able to stay with us, unfortunately, because we're late. I'm very sorry about that, that we came so late to you. You won't be able to stay with us for the, the panel discussion, but you very generously have shared your contact details with us and we'll share those with our um, panelists and attendees if anybody wants to get in contact with you with, this, with, with you with a specific question. So thanks so much for your time, Tiernan. and really appreciate it. That was really, really interesting about that initiative. So thanks so much. Thanks, and continued best of luck with, with the work. Thank you. Now we um, are going to move on to, we're actually going to have a slight change in our running order. We were initially going to speak with Niall Muldoon now, but because of time constraints and you know his schedule, we're actually going to skip ahead. Niall has generous, generously agreed to go third, and we're going to skip ahead now to Professor Alfgeir Chris Jansen, who is Associate Professor at West Virginia University and expert in adolescent health behaviors with attention to substance use prevention and community health pr promotion. Alfgeir, I'm so sorry that we're coming to you so late. You've been so kind with your time and you've been up all morning. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. That's not a problem. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm here on the East Coast of the US and it's um, about 7.30. We're waking up after the uh, feast of uh, of Thanksgiving yesterday and I uh, still can taste the meat and the pie that uh, I obviously ate way too much of yesterday as I always do. Um, I want to introduce briefly in a few minutes um, what we call the Icelandic prevention model which is a primary prevention approach to substance use prevention. Um, in 10 minutes there's only Obviously, so much I can say, but I'm going to try to give you the the briefs so that you at least uh, have a picture of uh, what this is. Uh, the model is guided by what we call the five guiding principles, uh, which sort of set the tone for the theoretical underpinnings and um, the approach. Different from most primary prevention approaches, the Icelandic prevention model is not based on educational outreach in the sort of general sense. It's not based on the idea that we are going to run a multitude of instructional programs to teach kids about the harm of drugs, which is a much more traditional way of doing things. Uh, the Icelandic prevention model, model is more about what we call community engagement, where we actually collaborate and create a process and a platform for um, community members and local teams to work with researchers and experts. So the first uh, uh, guiding principles is titled applying a primary prevention approach, which simply means that our approach is to prevent the onset of use. And there are multi multiple reasons for why we focus on the onset of use, but we know from various different studies, studies into cost benefits, studies into risk of, of, of various other types of outcomes, that if we can delay the onset of use, as opposed to focus mostly on behavior change approaches, if we can delay the onset of use at the population level, 
we are quite likely to be very successful uh, moving onwards with regards to mitigating life-threatening circumstances and, of course, saving a lot of cost. Sorry, Alvaro, to interrupt you. I'm very sorry, but we can't actually see your slides. If you're having trouble, trouble sharing them, we can share them for you if that would make it easier. Oh, I apologize. Can you see them now? Yay, there we go. Yeah, if you just want to make them full screen, that would be great. Thanks so All much, right. Alvaro. Great. I, I apologize. All right. Yeah, so what I was saying is that the model is guided by what we call the five guiding principles. And the first one is to apply a primary prevention approach. We're, we're, simply, we're simply saying that it is at the population level, and this is an important caveat. We're working at a population level. If our aim is to reduce the problem of drugs in society, we're probably better off trying to reduce the number of kids that initiate early as opposed to solely focus on behavior change approaches. I'm not saying, and we are not saying we have anything against such services. We're just saying that if it is a policy at the population level to reduce the problem of drugs generally, then primary prevention, the delaying of the onset on average in the population, let's say from 14 to 16 or any higher than that, uh, that we have really, really um, acquired something quite important because our early onset predicts uh, the odds of later problems. And the earlier the start, the more likely they are to get into serious trouble with drugs later on. And this also means that if we delay, are able to delay the early the onset uh, for a year or two or even more at the average in the population, then we will also have prevented all kinds of additional um, problems that come along with early substance use, such as school dropout, teenage pregnancies, and things of that nature. The second uh, guiding principle is about em emphasizing community action and, um, and uh, embrace public schools as the natural hub of neighborhoods or area efforts. This doesn't mean that this is a school-based approach. It simply means that schools are representative units of areas. So if we take a measurement at the school level, we are really assessing the community around them. So as opposed to using randomized samples at the population level, if we used focused samples at the school level with very high response rates, then we are truly representing the area around each school. And in most places, schools are organized by geographical districts, which means that the kids that live in the area around each school, they are uh, the school is a representative unit. The schools are also an accessible infrastructure for in most communities, which means that they can be used and, and collaborated with to tie the community together in terms of meetings and outreach, for example. And that leads us to guiding principle three, which is to engage and empower community members to make practical decisions using high quality and local accessible data. That means that in order for us to move forward with our work in um, local areas, we need to bring the local people to the table as opposed to the traditional top-down approach where we are aiming to have experts come into areas to tell people what to do. Research actually shows that those kinds of approaches don't work very well for the long run. It is much more viable to get local people to the table in a structured format to work with us moving forward. Um, guiding principle four, therefore, is about integrating researchers, policymakers, practitioners, and local community members into a unified team. So there's a system of team building locally that we can move forward with. And guiding principle five, which it says matching the scope of the solution to the scope of the problem, simply means that we need to allow more time and resources into primary prevention than we typically do. Most primary prevention is conducted with short-term programs that really are geared towards quick educational fixes. They're not really thought as community building or community engagement approaches, which may take several years. Now, the ecological domains of intervention focus is, are, 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 are solidified in these four major areas, um, parents and family, the peer group, the school environment, and leisure time. Our view is that kids are basically product of those four major domains. A child that is in good standing with their parents and family is well supported by them, has good friends to hang out with, likes to go to school, 
doesn't have to be an A student, just is okay and safe to go to school and has something productive, pro-social and character building to do in their leisure time. A child with this um, profile does really have a very low risk of engaging early in substance use. So our risk and protective factor measurement really is geared towards these four domains or, or standardized factors within those four domains. And, and, and importantly, those assessments are conducted at the local school community level because that's where kids spend 90% plus of their time. So if we take a measurement point within those areas and disseminate and collaborate with those um, measurement points within the local areas, then we really have some to build on to move forward. In Iceland, the municipal units are really around the schools. In the US, for example, where I live, those would be counties and local um, departments of education. So it just varies a little bit between places. Now, in terms of formal structure, the steps to implementation have also been uh, outlined clearly and, and, and published. And let me just run through them quickly for the, uh, in the interest of time. Step one is about local coalition identification and development. In other words, we need to have a local team to work with in every school community. And this doesn't mean that it's, again, put on the schools to do so. They should certainly be involved, but this should include both parents and caregivers, professionals, local business leaders, law enforcement, and so on and so forth. People that really know the area well. The key thing is that they are local representatives. The second thing is local funding identification, development and capacity building. Unfortunately, historically, we have really worked primary prevention and assumed that primary prevention is something that we do for free with our left hand in our free time. Primary prevention should be funded and it should be funded adequately just like other forms of prevention. So there needs to be at least a person within each local team that is fully funded to carry the ball. The second, excuse me, the third, the third step is pre-data collection planning and community engagement. In this step, we're basically educating our community and bringing people in to work with us on how to move this thing forward. Let them know what we're trying to do, bring people into the team that want to be engaged and um, begin to develop uh, what we need to do for step four, which is about data collection that takes place in schools. Once we have collected the data, we go back out in the community and we enhance community participation and engagement by basically um, advertising and planning dissemination in various different forms. This can be done in local meetings, through social media systems, through flyer systems, take home messages, and, and, and so on and so forth. In step six, we disseminate what we planned in, steps, in step five. Step seven is about setting goals based on the local findings in comparison to other areas and by garnering the feedback from the community. Because usually local community members know quite well what the local issues are. And in my experience, having done this for a while in multiple different places in different countries, those are usually not anything that is very, very high level, very expensive, and so on and so forth. People typically tend to ask for relatively simple, straightforward things that can easily be done. In step eight, we look at current policy and practice, meaning that there is quite the chance that there are other initiatives ongoing in the same areas that are double dipping into what we are trying to do. And we are much better off collaborating rather than relying on multiple different entities trying to do the same thing. This is a recurring problem in health promotion and primary prevention in most places where we have grant-based short-term programs dipping into the same issue repeatedly. Now, I could talk forever about my frustration with this short-term grant-based system, which seems to be quite common and, and is, is, in my view, completely detrimental to progress. And in step nine, only after we've done everything else, we choose carefully what interventions to run at the local community level based on resources, based on cost, based on abilities, and obviously based on our um, personnel in each area. And this, again, doesn't have to be something very expensive in each round, but it should be something that is attainable by local folks. And repeatedly and, 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 and um, to work on this consecutively over an extended period of time 
will begin to change the local community as opposed to beginning uh, from the start with primary uh, educational approaches every single year. Uh, Iceland started doing this in the late 90s and um, they sort of moved away from traditional educational programs and they went from having some of the highest numbers of substance use in all of Europe to either the absolute bottom or being near the bottom. It took about 15 years to have almost half of our kids being drunk every month to about six or 7% between 98 and 2012-13. And since 2012 and 13, our numbers have consistently been very low. That includes tobacco use, cannabis use, uh, drunkenness or alcohol use, and indeed other drug use uh, for kids at the in 10th grade and younger. So, you know, we believe that, that, that these kinds of approaches as opposed to assuming that substance use is randomly distributed in the population and primarily worked at the individual level is a much more viable approach, but it will take quite a different um, thinking. So it is quite a paradigm shift in our traditional way of doing um, individually based prevention. Thank you. Thanks, Alger. That was really interesting. Thanks so much for sharing that with us and again for your patience in our uh, with our timing issues. I was just wondering with your with the 10 steps in your experience, do you find that there are particular steps where people can get stuck for a while or like what are the trickiest steps to implement along the way? Yeah, very good question. My experience has been that the key steps to um, facilitate progress are the first two steps. And unfortunately, for because of funding restrictions or, or requirements or demands by funders or planners, which often tend to be elected officials, we tend to either skip them or do them poorly, which means that once it comes to measurement and dissemination and true community engagement, there isn't really a solid local team to go to. So my advice is always spend all the time you need on the local team building. Make sure you have the right people at the table before you move into any measurement, because otherwise this is just going to be another school survey. Yeah, it's a good point. And, you know, when you were showing us there, that kind of longitudinal look at like the 15, 20 years of how figures were going down, do you find there's a sort of an average period of time within which it takes people to implement the 10, the 10 steps or does it vary wildly? So our, our plan is that this should be an annual or biannual cycle. And you, need, you may need multiple cycles to really get this moving. Um, and probably about three cycles to truly change the way that we are used to working. But if we are successful in creating this system around, let's say, two or three cycles, I have not met any practitioner that wants to go back to the old system of grants, programs, grants, programs, grants, programs. Sure. So usually, if we are able to facilitate the underpinnings and build this system up, I've never seen anybody say, oh, I don't like this. Let's go. I don't want to make decisions about my community. Let me go back to the randomness of grant run programs and then perhaps maybe we will see if we can be successful. This gives people a routine assessment that they can work with again and again and again, where they can also have an estimate and assessment of what they were doing in the prior year with comparison to both previous years and other areas. So they have something to compete for. It's much less random and much more focused. But it does take time. And oftentimes, our planners, including funders and particularly elected officials, do not allow for that time. Mm. But I mean, it sounds like the empowerment that people take from it fuels that momentum to keep it on its legs when it gets going. That's exactly right. And that's why it's so important for us to get the right people to the table from the start. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, just one last thing before you go. I'm just wondering, in the various different locations that this has been implemented, have you encountered particular 
sort of cultural challenges or differences in different communities that made it more difficult or that threw up particular um, challenges you weren't expecting? Oh, yes, we've learned quite a lot. And um, it's, it's quite interesting that in the year 2022, we still are, despite all the emphasis on implementation science and and, and cultural appropriateness and so on and so forth, we still find that researchers, policymakers, and practitioners work in three different silos. And <laughs> so, you know, this, this, the idea of getting them all to the table is still quite revolutionary. Once they're at the table, we see that uh, commonly that their language and focuses are just very, very different to this day. So, any sort of society or any local unit which has sort of a better way of communicating across different groups, they tend to typically do better. In, in very um, sort of starkly or strongly class divided societies also, this tends to be more diff difficult because, you know, class division operates as such, you work within the layers of your class. It's it's hard to basically don't speak the language of people in different layers of the class division. And that often create, oftentimes creates problems of communication. Um, but, and the, I would say that these are sort of the primarily two main issues that we commonly have, and they can, they can um, uh, be visible almost anywhere. Mm, that's really interesting. Uh, one last question has just come in for you there. It's about, um, how adaptable do you think like obviously the model you're talking about is around reduction of substance abuse and i'm just wondering how applicable that is maybe to youth mental health issues more generally do you think yeah it's a very good question and a common question very common question particularly because both our policy-based units they often focus on both mental health and substance or substance use as a part of mental health funding lines often focus on both. What I can say is that because it's a primary prevention approach and we work strongly on the social and environmental underpinnings of substance use risk, we tend to see positive outcomes in lots of other things, including mental health, bullying, school dropout, and so on. Mm -hmm. But the model really hasn't been tested rigorously for those other outcomes. So that's why I'm a little hesitant in saying, yes, it works for all kinds of things. But th this is what we tend to see. So generally speaking, we can think about it in this way. Risk and protective factors are strongly interlinked. If we work on two or three big ones, we will get lots of positive outcomes. Mm, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm conscious we've eaten up loads of your time and you have pumpkin pie and turkey leftovers with your name on them that you need to get back to. So belated happy Thanksgiving. Thank you so much for your time that you spent with us today, Afghir. That was really interesting. And I know Thank people found much. it really helpful. So take care. All the best. Thanks. Thanks for having Thanks me. Thanks now. Not at all. A pleasure. OK, we're going to move on now to the Ombudsman for Children, Niall Muldoon, who's very kindly going to join us. Thank you, Niall, for being so flexible in terms of moving your position on the running order. We really appreciate it. No problem. No Thanks. problem. You can hear me OK? Yes, we can. Have you slides if you want to fire I have them? No slides, Jan. I'm, see them. No, no slides, I'm, I'm afraid. That's people music are going to, to my ears, Niall. That's yeah. music to my ears. It keeps it simple. Thank I, I, I never got the hang of it despite COVID. Um, Thank you very much to everybody for our, for the to St. Pat's for the invitation to present here today and to Paul Gilligan for the for the opportunity. Um, I really enjoyed this morning. I suppose I'm going to start off with a with an unusual the, the sections about implementation. So I thought we'd start off with a definition of implementation. It's uh, defined as the execution or practice of a plan, a method, or any design standard or policy for doing something. And as such, implementation is the action that must follow any preliminary thinking. For something to actually happen and perhaps it's that last piece the uh, action that must follow for something to actually happen that ireland often le is let down by um, particularly in relation to our children and their mental health we had a vision for change in 2006 with a well laid out plan and exact numbers for cams teams and an outline of who should be included in every one of those teams but that was predicated on the sale of all the big psychiatric institutions around the country as we move toward a community-based model of mental health support. 
many of those hospitals were on large sites and prime locations around the country. And in 2006, we're predicted to bring in hundreds of millions of euros when we sold them off to developers. However, we did not allow for Lehman Brothers and the subsequent global financial crash. Thus, the implementation was severely hampered due to a lack of funding. And we were left with a plan for over 100 teams made up of 10 to 12 professions all across the country. And then as every year passed, our frustration grew because we never reached the targets for teams established nor professionals in each team. Implementation falling short is very frustrating for everybody, but it's my job to constantly remind our government and public servants that the impact of this is not the same as being unable to build an IDA factory or finish a road project. Because for every shortfall in staffing for Vision for Change plan, a child is like, was likely to suffer harm or remain in pain for much, much longer than they needed to. And there's no sugarcoating that. I was consistently critical of the Vision for Change plan for only having a single chapter on children. And I was really excited at the prospect of that changing when there was talk of reviewing the plan around 2016. I called at that time for a standalone Vision for Change for children so we could specifically cater for their needs, their issues, and ring fence their funding. I argued that while the original Vision for Change had, a ch had children in chapter 10, nobody ever actually got as far as chapter 10. Therefore, we needed to be forthright and specific and clear that we were setting out a plan that is solely about children's mental health and how we will support those who fall ill in that space. Unfortunately, I didn't have to worry about how we'd implement such a plan because the decision was made to refresh the vision for change. And so sharing the vision was born. Again, I'm gonna to go to a definition. Refresh means to give new strength or energy to or reinvigorate. And I'm not sure in relation to child and adolescent mental health, if that has happened so far. However, I'm really encouraged by the new implementation plan for sharing the vision, 2022 to 24, which I really hope will allow us to avoid the stalling and stagnation which bedeviled the vision for change. And it's people by a lot of really good and uh, hardworking people. So I look forward to seeing that implementation plan coming together. The title I put on the speech, I don't often put titles on speeches, but I was asked to, um, the title I put on the speech was Implementation Deficit Disorder which is a phrase often used by Ireland's first special rapporteur in child protection, Dr. Geoffrey Shannon. Geoffrey was a very articulate, astute and brave rapporteur. And he was adamant that Ireland had some of the best written, well-researched and often innovative policies in the world. However, over his 11 years in that role, he got to recognize that the production of such a policy was often just used as the final solution. He could see that very many politicians and public servants quoted from a new policy and outlined all the wonderful things in it. And then they kept referring to that policy over the next three to five years. And they might add, also add in how much money was going to be spent on it and what was budgeted for it. But they never actually implemented it in the way it was designed. If a lack of staffing was an issue, that too became an excuse and a way to refer to the great policy and intentions, but deflect from its implementation. Staffing issues never seem to lead to staffing solutions or innovation. Within mental health, recruitment issues have been blamed on a worldwide shortage for four or five years now, and an assumption that, sure, there's nothing else we can do if the world hasn't got psychiatrists or psychiatric nurses, psychologists, whoever. However, if we're truly going to refresh something and give it new energy and new strength, then new ideas and innovation in regard to recruitment would have to be part and parcel in the same. I'm seven years in this post as Ombudsman for Children and have yet to see or hear about a recruitment plan from the HSE, which included increasing college posts or training posts for nurses, psychologists, OTs or SLTs. I know that psychiatrists are training enough people but cannot recruit them into child psychiatry or keep them there on a long-term basis when they do go into that speciality. Again, do we have a plan to plug that hole? Psychological Society of Ireland said that there are 50 psychologists training every year in a three-year doctorate. So if the government had committed to doubling that number back in 2018, we would have an extra 100 trained psychologists by now, and they would be ready to be deployed. It wouldn't be the full solution, but it would help. And we could do that across a number of professions, and we need to start being proactive in our recruitment plans. 
I cannot be sure that such initiatives would be the answer to our problems, but it must surely be considered and tried before being dismissed. This is the time, I think, maybe to bring in a uh, reference to famous person, Jonathan Swift. Again, hugely important um, innovator in his time, as seen by the, the work that's been carried out by St. Pat's Hospital ever since. He said, you should never be ashamed to admit you've been wrong. It only proves that you're wiser today than you were yesterday. Unfortunately, I feel that within the Irish mental health system, not enough people are willing to admit such mistakes and therefore losing out on the learning to be gained from such humility. Might we have too many people who consider themselves to be so wise that nothing need change from yesterday to today? And lest anyone concern themselves that I might not understand what all of this means for the children of our great country, I'm fully aware of the adverse effects of the delays for these children, because we hear regularly in our office from parents and children themselves about a lack of support due to long waiting lists. I hear about children still needing to go to emergency departments where they're likely to be surrounded by adults with very distressing physical ailments and perhaps suffering the ill effects of alcohol or substance abuses. And when they're feeling, they're going to these emergency departments when they're feeling suicidal and when they get there, they're still left waiting for so long that some of them will actually leave without being seen. I hear about GPs who work extremely hard to keep a child or teenager safe over a number of years when they have poor mental health. But when the time comes for that GP to refer to young persons to some more serious interventions, the referral is often refused for reasons they're not sure of. I hear about children with high levels of depression and anxiety who cannot be seen by CAMS because they have an intellectual disability. I do note from the minister said this morning about um, increasing the number of teams in relation to CAMS and intellectual disability, and that's excellent to hear. I hear about children who have depression and suicidal thoughts who cannot get to be seen by CAMS because they have an addiction problem alongside their mental health difficulties. And again, Professor McGorry spoke about Headspace and their automatically looking at alcohol and drug issues for children. We need to look at that in an innovative way and get that comorbidity worked on. I've met with these children personally and their families and it breaks my heart that I believe, unfortunately, that the mental health system now is no better than it was seven years ago. In reaction to these issues, I've been considering how we as an office can go upstream on these issues and help these children earlier in the process. Mental health has been part of all three strategic plans that I have developed as Ombudsman for Children. But within the current plan for 2022 to 24, we've created a key goal to promote the inclusion of mental health supports and services, including therapeutic supports within all schools. This is an effort to offer a way to relieve the strain on primary care psychology and on CAMS by promoting early intervention within a system where the child already feels safe and secure. And again, You've got a great, great example there from Tiernan and, and Moy Ross and Limerick. Mental health and psychosocial problems, as everybody attending here today already knows quite well, are primary causes of ill health, morbidity, and mortality, mortality among adolescents, particularly among those within vulnerable groups. These are facts that must always be to the fore when we're pushing therapy in schools. It's those facts that mean we can be in no doubt that such therapy is not a luxury, but a necessity. The UN Committee on the Rights of the Child emphasizes that a comprehensive multi-sectoral response is needed through integrated systems of adolescent mental health care that involve the students themselves, parents, peers, the wider family and schools, and the provision of support and assistance through trained staff. St. Patrick's Hospital has set out its vision, which is to see a society where all citizens are empowered and given the opportunity to live mentally healthy lives and they aim to do that with an emphasis on the human rights of all patients. Great credit must go to St. Patrick's Hospital through their excellent CEO, Paul Gilligan, for their work in supporting research back in 2017, which highlighted the huge need within primary schools for therapeutic services. Since then, they've also worked with the National Parents Council to find a reliable and evidence-based options for schools. And again, you heard their engagement around the Moy Ross project. The option they found is now being called the English model, whereby the Departments of Health and Education in England have cooperated to create a series of mental health teams which cater for up to 10 schools at a time. Each team caters for 10 schools. 
The Department of Education here in Ireland have pledged 5 million euro to counselling in primary schools from September 23. And I spoke at the Oireachtas Committee on Education this week, earlier this week, urging the Department of Health to pledge the same amount to create a proper pilot programme which could take the English model and build it up here in Ireland. There's a window of opportunity opening up now for our politicians and our civil servants to create a world-class therapeutic service within our education system that is collaborative and integrative, not separate and not in competition with our health system. That's crucial. Our children deserve no less. Thank you very much for the invitation again to speak here today at this great conference. And on a personal note, I just want to thank Paul Gilligan for his uh, huge amount of work he's done over the years and is important, strong, and an influential leader in this area. And uh, I will wish you well for the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thanks, Niall. That was great. Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. And I know you're going to stay with us for the panel discussion in a little while. So thanks. Thanks for that. But now we're going to move on to our final speaker. We're going to end um, our contributor program just as we began it with um, a contribution from a mental health advocate, a young person who's experienced a lot of what it is we've been talking about across the day. Blessing Dada is a mental health advocate with a focus on intersectionality and we're just we're so glad to welcome you Blessing, thanks so much for joining us and I'll I'll hand it over to you, I don't know if you have slides or if you're just, you, you do, great if you want to share those there and we can just check that everything's in order before we, we kick off so that I'm not interrupting you halfway through. <laughs> I don't know if you can see the slides there. Yeah, we can, Blessing. They're great. If you could just make them full screen, that's perfect. There we go. OK, perfect. That's great. Thanks, Blessing. Awesome. Um, thank you so much um, for having me on. I was almost panicking a little bit because my electricity decided to go um, 10 minutes ago, but it decided to come back just in time. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for inviting me here. And, you know, it's just been really interesting to hear other people speak about the topics um, during this webinar. Um, so I hope I can kind of do my best up to their standards as well. Um, but to introduce myself, <clears throat> my name is Blessinella and I am a mental health advocate and born and raised in Dublin, Ireland. And I raise awareness of my lived experiences living with mental health difficulties um, through kind of creating content online, mostly through Instagram, um, writing and kind of participating in youth mental health organizations in Ireland, such as um, Sea Change and Spun Out and the Shona project as well. Um, and yeah, I suppose um, I might talk about it a little bit again in the end or throughout the slides. I suppose one of my reasons of becoming a mental health advocate was because being born and raised to um, in Ireland as a first generation black Irish to immigrant parents, um, I went through the school system and, you know, grew up in Irish society and I just didn't see anyone that looked like me that spoke about their mental health and different issues that people in the black community would specifically go through. Um, so it kind of took me a lot longer to kind of get the help and kind of do a lot of work to undo kind of internalizing the shame and stigma. Um, so between the ages of 12 to 14, when I understood like what mental health was and, you know, just through going through adverse childhood experiences. Um, yeah, from then on, I just decided to um, speak up from there. And, you know, I just kind of didn't really relate to kind of the topics that were kind of raised in school and um, a lot of it was kind of very surface level and I didn't really get any kind of perspective of how things like experience and racism and how it affects your mental health I didn't really get any of that so yeah my 
kind of direction is kind of focusing more on intersectionality within the mental health space and kind of raising um, awareness on things that wouldn't necessarily make it to mainstream mental health awareness in the media or in organizations. Um, so yeah, in the next slide, I'll just quickly explain um, what intersectionality is, just in case anyone isn't familiar with it here. <clears throat> so basically the concept of intersectionality describes the ways in which systems of inequality based on gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, class, and other forms of discrimination kind of intersect to create unique dynamics and effects. Um, so all forms of inequality are mutually reinforcing and must be analyzed and addressed simultaneously to prevent one form of inequality from reinforcing another. So an example I kind of added in the slide was um, tackling the gender pay gap alone and without including other dimensions such as race and socioeconomic status and migration status. Um, this would likely reinforce inequalities among women. Um, and yeah, every time I kind of try to talk about intersectionality, a lot of people kind of make the mistake that it just kind of affects, you know, the black or brown community or ethnic minority communities. Whereas like re in reality, um, everyone is impacted by intersectionality. We all kind of exist in different identities that shape the different type of lives that we that we live in. Um, so what is intersectional justice? Um, so I added this in to talk about understanding discrimination and inequality, not as an outcome of individual intentions, but rather as a systematic institutional and structural uh, dynamic. Um, so therefore, intersectional justice can be achieved through institutions that directly and indirectly allocate opportunities and resources, including in the school system, in the labor market, um, in the health and social insurance system, the housing market, media, and so forth. Um, and the reason why I'm just really passionate about intersectionality and talking about systematic and institutional and structural things um, is just that from my lived experiences and when it comes to talking about seeking help and my identity of living in Irish society, I kind of find a lot of the information to be very um, to be very kind of almost individualistic and, um, you know, and I, I just think that like a lot of things could be changed through kind of like a collective and intersectional lens and, you know, kind of focusing on kind of a more broader picture of different struggles that people may be going through. And um, so hence why I'm very passionate about intersectionality. Um, so I think the next slide is talking about cultural competency and the importance of it in mental health. Um, so receiving cultural competence in mental health care is just very, very important. Um, it means that if you are a provider, you are able to interact effectively with people of different cultures by incorporating their unique beliefs, behaviors, and needs into their diagnosis and or treatment plan. Um, but it also means, um, you know, times taken into consideration, consideration of, you know, different hurdles and added stigmas that, you know, the black community, um, people of color and the traveler community, especially, um, different stigmas that they would go through and that over time it would have an enormous impact on their mental health and the ability to um, find the right trusted source of help. Um, and yeah, I also kind of added this in because um, 
I find within the black community, especially, <clears throat> apologies, when people are kind of struggling with their mental health and, you know, it's, it's often that we kind of get information of like different kind of helplines to use or like different organizations to kind of reach out to. But um, I think just during my work as a mental health advocate, I would kind of have a few people kind of reach out and kind of ask if there is any other kind of um, alternative because they would kind of, in their experience, wouldn't find that people wouldn't be as cultural competent and it wouldn't be like um intentional it's, it was it's just mostly kind of down to lack of education and um that type of stuff but you know hopefully things are slowly changing um and i think in the next slide um i just talk about you know what happens when we and when the provider either has biases or lack in this area. Um, so, you know, not asking about people's cultures or history or beliefs, and especially into generational trauma, this can lead to different um, mental health consequences and misunderstanding, misdiagnosis, discrimination, and, you know, so many different things. And, you know, it just kind of reminds me of you know, next month would be coming up to two years of George Nakensho and um, his struggle with mental health and just so many different barriers that um, he fell through in that um, unfortunately just didn't work out for him. And, you know, it just has such a massive um, effect in the Black community, just working so hard to get people to speak up about their mental health and now I'm almost kind of like at you know the starting point again of just making people kind of build that trust relationship within a mental health services in Irish society um oh my gosh I need to speak up real fast sorry <laughs> so to kind of help with this um area um mental health reform have um a cultural competence toolkit um, and this is due to the research that there is higher incidence of mental health challenges among people of ethnic minority communities. And this toolkit is available on Mental Health Reform's website. And, you know, it helps just to structure around the importance of um, sensitive topics within the within ethnic minority communities. Um, I will go as fast as I can because I know we are <laughs> short of time. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I talked about earlier on about um, specific issues that ethnic minority communities um, would kind of go through that isn't often necessarily talked about in mainstream media. Um, so one of these issues would be adultification. And I added this here as a really big topic in the conversation, but also part of my lived experiences as well. Um, so when it comes to working with young people in uh, Ireland, that's coming very diverse. Um, adultification is important to be aware of because it is used to define how black children are viewed as older than they are. Um, and systematic racism has forced black children into social emotional and physical adult roles before they are even adults contributing to adult, adultification. And while children of many different backgrounds can experience adultification, um, I think that it's, it's important not to uni universalize it to the point where <clears throat> we take a one size fits all approach to the topic. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that it specifically affects black children. Um, and, you know, there's many different stereotypes that comes with it. And, you know, it's a lot of it is not new. Unfortunately, it's been around for a while. Um, but yeah, looking at it through an intersectional lens in terms of gendered racism, um, we hear that black boys are either aggressive, criminal, 
deviant perpetrators and that they are the ones causing harm and that we need to safeguard people from them rather than them needing safeguarding. Um, so there's many different um, research and books and things to back up um, the conversation in this area. Um, and then one I can relate very hard to is the stereotypes of black girls that, that they are seen as hypersexual in nature, loud, strong, rude, and that they can withstand any type of abuse. Um, so yeah, in general, black children are more likely to be met with suspicion than care. Um, and yeah, even within my activism, um, you know, when I talk about different things like racism and um, intersectionality, um, a lot of people would kind of paint me as the poster girl for being a strong black woman. And the comment is very, comes across as like well-intentioned, but living with mental illnesses is definitely not something that I want to um, kind of have to uphold kind of like a certain image and especially when it comes to kind of talking about unpopular topics within mental health and um, just experiencing a lot of racism would come with that and it's just always kind of trying to decide how I react and even if I react in the way that I'm speaking right now and um, people would still paint me as like coming across very angry even though there might be circumstances where it is valid but um yeah, just kind of trying to manage <laughs> with that. Um, next one would be kind of more impacting the I Irish Asian community. So this would kind of be talking about the model minority stereotype. Um, so before I added the slide, I consulted with my Asian Irish friends to kind of help back this up. Um, so for many Irish Asian young people, the experience of being a racial minority in Ireland is largely informed by the media and by the model minority stereotype, um, which is a cultural expectation that their demographic will achieve a higher degree of socioeconomic success. Um, so specifically, this stereotype suggests that the community best embody um, an incredible strong work ethic and inherent intelligence. And um, so according to my friends, they find themselves very pressured to attend prestigious universities and um, esteemed careers and kind of just either being left with options such as like law, medicine or engineering. And if it's any other option, then, you know, it's, it's not, the right option um, so this stereotype is harmful for many reasons because it pits minority groups against um, each other and um, it invalidates people's complex experiences and overlooks struggles of being Asian Irish and reinforces cult unhealthy cultural expectations about success and resilience so there's more information about there because I know I am taking up so much time, but there is more research out there online and from lived experiences of many people in the community. And um, so I think the last one would, oh, there we go. So that was the last slide. So um, yeah, just in general, I just really hope that um, when it comes to professionals in the mental health space, in the system and in, training in third level education that they do try to I guess um always question the material that they are taught of in in third level and just try to be inclusive as much as possible because a lot of ethnic minority communities kind of almost have to look to the NHS website for example for kind of more um help or topics that's kind of related to their lived experiences and um, and you know there's many people doing great work in the area i forgot to add black therapist ireland if you guys aren't familiar with them and um, they were an organization founded in october of 2020 and 
they are a group of accredited therapists that basically came together to put material um, and put their services in kind of one space so that if anyone's looking for a black therapist, they work with all ethnic minorities um, in Ireland. Um, and yeah, it was just really awesome to see that because before 2020, I didn't know black therapists even existed in Ireland because talking about your mental health in the black community is very, very highly stigmatized. A lot of people would come from um, religious um, backgrounds and struggling with your mental health is seen as a sin or you haven't prayed enough or you must have done something wrong. Um, so Black Therapist Ireland, if you guys are interested, they are on Instagram and um, their website is also up on Google. And, you know, hopefully one day I would kind of see that when I Google up um, resource information is that like their website would be seen on pages like Pieta House and Jigsaw and Spun Out and et cetera, and just included in, in the conversation rather than kind of an add-on. And um, so, yeah, thank you so much for listening to me speak. I definitely know I went over 10 minutes, but um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Blessing. And don't worry about the time. It was really interesting. And it was so, those examples you gave of stereotypes were so interesting and just illustrated the points you were making so neatly. It was, thank you so much for that. It was really, really interesting. And just to let you know that we've put links to the Mental Health Reform Cultural Competency Toolkit that you referenced, which looks great. We've put links to that into the chat and also a link to um, Black Therapists Ireland as well. So oh, that people thank can, you can so much. I forgot to add it in the slide. Not at all. You, so you put so much in there, not at all. Um, so, I mean, we literally just now have somebody straight in the, in the chat saying that for them, yours was the best presentation of the day. So take that. Oh, well thank done. You so <laughs> I was so nervous. I was trying not to sweat. I was like, oh my good <laughs> <laughs> no you were great so we're now just going to have a short panel discussion to wrap up like if anybody has any questions that they want to include or equally if um if there's anything additional that you want to mention yourself uh professor paul fearon is going to join us again and dr niall muldoon if you're there also that would be great um i'm just going to check if we have any uh additional questions that have come in and while i'm doing that you know, Paul, is there any comments you'd like to make on, you know, the implementation part of um, of the day that we've, we're, Blessing has just rounded up for us there? Well, what well, it was, but Blessing, thank you so much for that talk. It was, it was fabulously penetrating and, 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 uh, and so candid. And uh, what I was going to ask you actually was, where do you think we are in Ireland at the moment in terms of that journey towards both intersectionality, but also cultural competence, um, because, you know, we all live here, but, you know, we may not have a sense of that. Do you think we're just at the beginning of that journey? And I'm not just talking about mental health services. I'm talking about as a society. Are we partly along the way? Um, where do you think we are in your own view? Um, I think personally, um, I think we are still in the very new stages, but I also understand um, I under, under I also understand the reason why we're still in the very new stages. Like I know when I began as a mental health advocate, um, I didn't see anyone that looked like me, so I kind of looked to more mental health advocates within the UK and in and in the US, and they have more kind of history in that sense. Whereas like a lot of people like me would be you know, I'm in my 20s and I would be first generation Black Irish, whereas like people in the UK and in the US, a lot of them would be coming from families who are second generation or even third generation. And there's already like a very strong history built, mm -hmm. a very strong foundation built. So like, um, yeah, it's just an exciting time to see that um, in the last 20 years, um, it's 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 coming up and I definitely need to have my own part in being in patient as well because um it's you know at the end of the day it's it's only education that can change things and if people are just open to listening about these things and just kind of take an initiative to kind of um reach out for information that they aren't often taught out on their course and not just you know, graduate from psychology example and then just kind of leave that there. Um, yeah, I definitely am seeing more people becoming more um, 
critically aware of like what they're taught of and you know just being aware that we live in a more diverse society and so yeah there is I have friends who are studying psychology at the moment so um they often get me to look at their their um their 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 writing material and that type of stuff and I always just try my best to just spread resources because at the end of the day if you're not part of a certain community you're not really going to know what to do unless other people are speaking up from it so it's just my part to kind of speak up from it as well and hopefully people just kind of take it up rather than just listen to it and then let it go out the other ear but um yeah I hope that kind of helps a bit <laughs> great thanks Benson. well it's it's working in that one of our um one of our attendees today has just said that he to thank you for your sincere and informative presentation and that she'll be bringing all those links to her fellow psychotherapy students so it's working oh, what you're doing and that you are <laughs> spreading the information so well done you and um, Niall I'm just wondering in terms of intersectionality you know as an ombudsman for children here in Ireland you know would you have a perspective on maybe perhaps how other countries how we're faring by comparison to other countries maybe or I mean, again, I think Blessing has, has set it out very clearly. I think we, we are, I think we're learning an enormous amount by this first generation of young Irish black people, uh, non-national people who, who are speaking up where their parents just had to get by. We're learning an enormous amount from that. I mean, it's it's only last year that I, I even heard and to my great shame, I didn't know there was such a thing as, as medical racism, the, the concept that, you know, the way you see black women, the black men can be different in the medical upbringing. So again, there's a lot of stuff for us all to learn and to keep learning. And again, it's that sense of, as a society, we need to stop. We need to make sure we're humble all the time to keep learning. Internationally, I don't think all any country has got it right yet, but it's it's that that welcomeness, that openness to to hearing that you need to improve and that you knew you follow through in that need. I think we as a as a state and as public services, I think they're moving on that. They are get, we are getting better at that. And I think one of the things I would be suggesting is that we have a all public services have a public service, service duty built into legislation that needs to include the, the concept of um, diversity and intersectionality and, and ensuring that we as every public servant and public body understands as much as they can about that sort of the impact they can have if they aren't aware of these issues that blessing has brought up and of course so you know we're talking today about prevention and promotion strategies that's the focus of the day and it is interesting to think you know how we could potentially be providing much more unconscious bias training for example just at very early points in people across teachers medics many different industries to help everybody deliver a more inclusive and intersectional level of care Absolutely. I think it's great. It, it is the way forward. But again, it takes self-reflection to allow yourself to, to go for that training. But I think it's it's where you've got that impetus of a legislation, statutory obligation to public service duty. Maybe we need to build that into it and say we all need to engage in unconscious bias training um, because we don't know where our, our blind spots are until somebody points them out to us. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, Paul, just in conclusion, I'm not sure if there's any additional points you want to make. I mean, I'm conscious most people have been answering questions directly in the chat and Q&A function. So is there anything you'd like to share with people just as we prepare to wrap up? Sure. Well, I'd just like to thank everybody uh, for coming. I'll come to that in a moment. But I, I think what's striking me about, about today is uh, everything, and we've covered such a lot of ground, is number one, that everybody seems to be agreed in words, at any rate, right from government to services to uh, society to um, young people involved in services, that uh, raising awareness and promoting and preventing um, uh, um, mental ill health and promoting well-being in younger people is vital and um, I think Niall's point is very well taken that it's it's the implementation bit that's um uh, that, that's missing despite all the evidence whether it's economic moral uh, clinical etc uh, and in terms of avoiding distress they're all such compelling and the evidence is now there for those and um, I think the other thing is and again we knew this but it's, it's really nice to see it highlighted today is that this isn't the responsibility of any one uh, organization or any one part of society alone it's all our responsibilities right from the home to school to the workplace to services etc etc and all of them need to be involved Mary Callan 
Simon earlier talked about the gaps in services, but the, the, there are gaps, you know, um, between sectors and, and, and strata in society as well. They need to be bridged. Um, Having said that, the other thing that struck me in, in a really good way, and, and I think um, again Mary and I think Margaret and, and Pat referred to it, that we we do know some of these risk factors now that that not only we can identify them, but also that they're readily amenable if we can if we can target them, we can actually make a, a change in the in the way that if this is an, a, another sphere of, of medicine or, or ill health, if we knew that something that you know we could uh, avoid change a trajectory that quickly, we'd be jumping on it, and we should be doing this uh, more, and that needs to be published size more um so i mean i think those are the four kind of take home points for me i would just like to thank first of all obviously all the speakers I, i'm going to highlight obviously uh dan who spoke who uh, started and uh, talking all um the, the day and also blessing for their their insights their, their penetrative insights and your and um, the candid nature of your comments i think it really really added to the day um and, and i'd really like to thank both blessing and diana for that um i'd like to thank you jan obviously for as always um moderating with such professionalism and um and uh, and that and, and and hiding some of the cracks that uh, in the background that you know, produced um and uh, also the comms team uh tamara katie uh, sinead and others who, who again have been working tirelessly behind the scenes both before and today and finally to everybody who's attended for your interaction and your, your questions um i've really enjoyed and got an awful lot out of, out of the day so hopefully um i mean this isn't the only uh conference about younger people but the more of these that we have the more that we keep uh, our conscious of because my generation and the one above me are responsible for a lot of what we're talking about today. We may be talking about it, but you know, we're um, when we you know um, uh, uh, pass off, we're 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 giving a world that isn't in as good a place as it was to the younger generation. We have a moral imperative uh, to try and sort things out and to do our best. And I'm not sure we're doing as much as we could be as a as a generation as yet. But uh, I'll leave it on that upbeat note. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Well, we'll come back next year and assess how much further you've gotten, Paul. <laughs> we'll have a status update in a year's time. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Thank you, Niall and Blessing, for staying with us for that chat at the end. Thank you, Paul, and all the staff at St. Patrick's. Just before we wrap up, just to say that a reminder that the CPD points and certificates will be going out to anybody who registered for them within the next few weeks, if you allow six weeks max for those to, to arrive. The other thing is you'll see a link for feedback when this ends. And if you could fill that out, it's only a short survey. If you could fill it out, it would be great because it just really helps to inform the design and development of these kinds of events. And ultimately, you know, you can you can help shape what what these are like. So thanks so much. A recording of today's conference will be available on stpatricks.ie over the coming weeks. And all that remains for me to say is thanks so much for your time. And I hope that you got a lot out of it. I've no doubt that based on the interactions in chat and questions that you will have. So take care, everybody, and all the best.